The simple thing that foreign exchange is signaling right now is that the U.S. economy is faring better than the rest of the world. Right now, the U.S. is in somewhat better shape than Europe. It's further away from Ukraine. It's less exposed to the inflation. The ECB, obviously, in the near term, is going to tighten, but it's highly, highly unlikely that the Eurozone can avoid a recession. Right now, the dollar strength is as much a good thing as it is a bad thing. I think the recession in Europe and the energy crisis that is brewing is something investors cannot ignore. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan and Farrell and Lisa Abramowitz. TK didn't turn up this morning. <laughs> we sent out a search party. <laughs> Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow, together with the brilliant Katie Lines. Equity futures, positive two-tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, Lisa, up a third of 1%. Over the last seven days, what are we on on the Nasdaq Composite? A seven-day losing streak. Yeah. Brutal. It's been brutal, especially because of the why here. And it is hawkish tilt to the central bank discussions, as well as a deteriorating macro backdrop. And one of the most interesting things that happened overnight was weaker than expected Chinese economic data really fueling this feeling of a deteriorating economic uh, trajectory globally with the European uh, energy crisis, China, and now potentially even in the U.S. It takes us to the FX market. Dollar China, Bramo, 699, this close to a seven handle. How important is that? Well, I mean, Leland Miller was saying it's not that important. It's a psychological level. But it, right now, it doesn't seem like the Chinese authorities are pushing back that hard. They are just trying to control how quickly they see the weakening in the Chinese UN. It seems unavoidable. I mean, honestly, if you have a currency that reflects at all economic differentials and rate differentials, how does this not make sense that the dollar should continue to strengthen versus the Chinese UN? And Katie, you've been covering it with a team all morning. Dollar dominance, the big story this morning in this market. Yeah, and it's against everything in Asia not just the Chinese yuan. Dollar yen is the one that catches my attention today. We're at a 144 handle. That is not something we have seen going all the way back to August of 1998, a 24-year low on dollar yen. And yet the Bank of Japan overnight instead boosts its bond buying program, still dedicated to yield curve control, trying to keep that 25 basis point cap on a 10-year GGB. As we talk about persistent dollar strength, John, at what point does the BOJ hit a breaking point? Uh, right now it's not blinking. And that's the story, isn't it? So we've got rate hikes from the Federal Reserve delivering dollar dominance in the FX market. China lockdown is the second theme. And then, Bramo, we've got to talk about the response to the energy issues in Europe. I am still processing the potential of monster relief coming out of the UK and still asking the same question we started the week with. Yeah, who's going to pay for it, right? That's the question that a lot of people are wondering for. Stephen Major coming out of HSBC, and he's traditionally been a bond bull. And he actually uh, increased his forecast for the year-end yields for the United Kingdom in particular because of this concern of the extraordinary fiscal support for energy prices and what that means for its deficit, what that means for foreigners' willingness to fund it. And that, to me, is really going to be one of the main breaking points, not only for the United Kingdom, but also, to a lesser extent, the entire European region. Transferring massive risk back to the sovereign. We're all asking those questions, Lisa, and the phrase I've heard repeatedly in the last 24 hours, uncapped liability for the British government if they take this on. And it's truly uncapped. And it's starting to express itself in some FX forecasts. Look at this, 106 from Jordan Rochester over at Namora, year end on sterling. Euro dollar at 90 cents, year end on a euro. There's some major calls coming from some big shops. The amazing part about this is that he is so not alone, right? We have heard about possibly parity for the pound versus the dollar. I mean, that's sort of extraordinary to even think about. And then people are talking about 90 uh, per, per uh, dollar for the euro as a base case. I mean, hearing this more and more from an increasing number of cases, uh, from an increasing number of shops, simply because of this incredible divergence and because of the deteriorating backdrop. I just got a note, TK's lining up for the new iPhone. I'm told. <laughs> now? Is that true, Kaylee? Is he camping? Does he have a tent? How much more is this gathering? new iPhone going to cost him? I, I've heard up to $1,100, 1100. and it raises a question of when we're talking about inflation and an energy crisis and higher bills, who's going to pay to upgrade their iPhone if theirs is still working? Does that mind mean my iPhone's going to magically stop working mm -hmm. in the next couple of months? You know how this works, Bramo, the new one comes out, and then all of a sudden it stops working, <laughs> and then you I don't need know. to go and get a new one. <laughs> yeah, I'm not suggesting so anything nefarious is going on clearly, here. Clearly, not saying at all. That <laughs> something magic happens with the iPhone around the time that the new thing comes out. Is this a prediction? Are you basically I'd, saying that you want one I'll, or are you I'll saying that you think well, that you're going to be forced to buy one? just what to this. Futures <laughs> up a tenth of 1% on It'll the S&P sort of 500 on the Nasdaq 100. Everyone's sitting at home saying, yeah, he's right. 
happens to me too. Match no, it. it does not. Up a third of one percent on the Nasdaq. Nothing this nefarious. magically slows down. Yields down by four basis points on a ten year. Three thirty seventy three on a ten year. Euro dollar unchanged, just about hanging on to ninety nine on Euro dollar and crudely so eighty seven twenty nine up a half of one percent. Yeah, maybe it just feels slower simply because the others feel so fast, usually when they come out. I don't know. We can discuss it throughout the morning or perhaps we'll save everybody uh, and we won't. At ten AM I'm really interested to hear what the Bank of Canada is gonna say. They come out with their rate decision. The expectation is for a 50 or a 75 basis point rate hike. The Bank of Canada has been out front. This will be the fourth consecutive outsized rate hike at a time when their two-year yield is the highest going back to 2008. Their policy is going to be the highest going back to 2008. How do they do with front-loading policy? Because that has been very much a stated policy of theirs. How do we know it's working, and what does that mean for the rest of central banks around the world? We get so much Fed speak today. I mean, for a second, for a hot minute, we got a little bit of a reprieve, and then all of a sudden, here they all line up. What are they going to tell us that we don't already know? Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin out in the Financial Times overnight talking about how a 4% uh, or Fed funds rate actually seems plausible to him and that he could see holding it there for some time. We also hear from Loretta Mester, Cleveland Fed President Lael Brainerd around 12.30 uh, p.m. She's the Federal Reserve Vice Chair. Michael Barr, Federal Reserve Vice Chair for Supervision, also speaking around 2 p.m. at the same time that we get the Beige Book. Do we get any insight about some of the conflicting data that we're getting about whether we're slowing down or speeding up with consumer spending, picking back up on the heels of lower gasoline prices? And today, we do have a Barclays Chief Executive Officer Energy Conference in New York City. Our own Alex Steele is there. She's going to be interviewing a number of executives executives, including the, uh, the executives of ConocoPhillips, uh, Chevron, as well as Devon Energy. What do they say? And John, you talked about energy prices, that gasoline prices have come down, yes, but now we're seeing crude fall to some of its lowest levels in months. And this does not make sense if you look at some of the fundamental issues with respect to the OPEC uh, plus uh, supply cut. Yet this really speaks to the deteriorating expectation for the global economy. Lisa, thank you. Looking forward to the day ahead and looking forward to hearing what Vice Chair Brain has got to say as well on the economy specifically. I think it's the first time since Jackson Hole we've actually heard her address some big themes. So looking forward to that. Joining us now is Margie Patel, Senior Portfolio Manager at Allspring Global Investments. Margie, the Nasdaq Composite's down almost 9% over the last seven days. The last seven trading days, the S&P 500 over the same period is down about 7%. Are you ready to buy this equity market yet? Well, no, I think actually what we've had is about a reversal, about 50 percent of the rise we've had in those indexes since their lows in June. Uh, but I think we're really in a trading range with a downward bias uh, because of the backdrop. The Fed is very much committed to raising rates. Globally, you can see economies all around the world are slowing down, and that's really not a market that says we're on the verge of a uh, dynamic rebound in equities. So are you just moving more into cash? How do you manage in terms of some of this bearishness at a time when there still is uncertainty and still a potential investment case? I don't think cash is really uh, all that attractive at this level uh, because there is a chance the Fed might realize that they're being too aggressive, in my opinion, and uh, that could change things. So really, we're just trying to find companies that are reasonably priced, that have the possibility of continued earnings growth, which I think will be pretty hard to find over the next year. We're thinking earnings are going to decelerate a lot. So PEs are down, but with decelerating earnings, that still says a lot of stocks could go down. So trying to, to see where stocks still have a growth path and aren't too puffed up based on yesteryear's uh, idea of how fast the economy is going to grow. And how do you factor in the strength of the dollar into your thinking about these multinational companies? Um, you know, I've never really found that a uh, big help in, in making money in stocks because often the market will look through dollar strength. I think what it really tells you is that uh, it reflects the strength of the U.S. economy compared to Europe, compared to emerging markets, compared to China. So it says to me that we're still the best place to invest. And the dollar is really a reflection of that. Even at our rates today, we still see money coming in from foreigners because we're probably still the best economy in the world to buy. What does that become a headwind, though, Margie? And this is something people are increasingly asking as they, as they talk about coordinated intervention to some of the currency differentials. When does the dollar become a liability for U.S. companies that are trying to sell their goods overseas? Uh, well, I think that's really what you're seeing in a trend for slower growth and acknowledgments from any companies of where they saw rapid growth, say, in emerging market. They're now seeing that scaled back. So I think it's really part of the backdrop of earnings 
slowing down around the world, growth slowing down around the world. So therefore, it's going to be, you're going to have to be more choosy in finding companies that can uh, get through a period of very low growth. We haven't had that in quite a while. And here we have everything coming together, uh, and they're really all negative as far as future growth. Amagi, the bulk of your portfolio is in equities. We used to talk to you almost exclusively about fixed income. I wanted to squeeze a little bit more in on fixed income if we can. We're seeing signs that sovereigns in Europe are willing to take on uncapped liability and transfer massive risk away from the consumer to offset some of the pain sparked by energy issues across the continent. What do you think the consequences of that are going to be? Uh, well, when you have that kind of massive innovation, the, re the result is always the same, which is uh, those policies have a way of backfiring. Uh, for example, I think in England they did have some price caps a few years ago under Theresa May. That hasn't worked out very well. Uh, so I think that uh, it's really a negative for consumers and negative for those economies. Again, we, we are lucky enough that we don't have that here. Again, coming back to the case, our growth looks better than, than worldwide. Michael Patel of All Spring Global Investments, thank you. Lisa, this is the issue, I think, for a lot of people. And when you look at things relative to, to Europe, why we're going to hear more people like Marky Patel say, that's why I like the United States relative to the mess taking place elsewhere. Well, and the United Kingdom is in its own world of hurt. You know how we were talking about Goldman Sachs' call for 22% inflation in the United Kingdom? And what did we hear from some that this was outrageous? This is a marketing ploy. I think it was ploy. the city call was just some south side marketing, south according side. to one guest. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, Hugh Pill, who is the chief economist of the Bank of England, was testifying to Parliament today. And he says it's plausible, that 22% rate. There you go. Is he doing some south side He's doing south side marketing. The Treasury Select <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Clearly. So, someone just wrote in Detroit Tigers forever. My iPhone already feels slower just listening to you two talking about it. You see? Magic. Oh, <laughs> magic. right this, now? As soon as, it, as soon as it launches, it's the day of. Just yeah. start slowing down. They just put a t bug in there. T t I'm not saying anyone did anything. Of course I'm just not. Saying this is what oh, happens. yeah. Every single time. Just saying this is what happens, <laughs> all right? <laughs> sure. Up a tenth on the SP from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The Eurozone economy grew more than initially estimated in the second quarter. The revision revealed greater support from consumer and government spending. GDP rose eight tenths of one percent from the previous three months, two tenths of a percentage point higher than the first report. U.S. officials say that Russia wants to buy millions of rockets and artillery shells from North Korea. Now, it's the latest sign that Moscow is being pressured by international sanctions. There's no indication that any weapons sales have been completed. Last month, the CIA said Russia had approached Iran to buy armed drones. There's a report that one of the documents seized at Donald Trump's Florida residence describes a foreign government's nuclear weapons capabilities. That's according to The Washington Post. The newspaper also says that some of the documents discuss closely guarded, top secret U.S. operations. In China, export growth slowed more than expected last month. Global demand weakened, while COVID lockdowns disrupted manufacturing production. Meanwhile, imports barely grew as domestic demand continued to struggle. New research says that about half of U.S. workers could be described as quiet quitters. That is, they fulfill their job description but are psychologically detached from their work. The polling firm Gallup surveyed more than 15,000 workers. Gallup says most quiet quitters are looking for another job. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning, good morning. Equity futures pushing just a little bit higher, up two tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq 100, firmer by a third of 1%. The Nasdaq composite over the last seven days down every single day and negative close to 9%.
over that time period. Is it time to buy? Max Kettner of HSBC remains max underweight this equity market. Looking at a bond market where the two-year has started to build out just a little bit more over the last couple of trading days. Right now it comes back in down by three basis points to 346.81. Yesterday, a new closing high for the year at the front end of the curve. On the long end, that's what surprised me over the last week or so. The 10-year back to 332.64, not a million miles away from a year's high either. And Bramo, I think even the likes of Steve Major of HSBC, traditional bond bull, have to reassess a lot of people have to reassess what's going to happen this year. Yeah, he got more hawkish, upgrading his year-end forecast for 10-year Treasury yields from 25 to 3% because of some of the comments out of Jackson Hole. But a lot of the action over the past couple of trading sessions has also become because of the volume of corporate debt sales as well. So there are some technical things under the table here for the long end as well. Reassessing what's happening in the FX market yeah. too. Let's take a look at two currency pairs. The dollar index, I'll start there. Strongest since June 2002 at the close yesterday. Then you look at this. So, so close on dollar China to a seven handle. And Katie Lines, dollar yen, 144. I think you've got to go back to, what is it, August 1998 yeah. to see the Japanese yen this week. Just over 24 years. It's been that long since we've seen a Japanese yen this week. And what does the BOJ do, John? Nothing about it. They're just boosting their bond buying, still sticking with yield curve control, being the ultra doves in a world in which everyone else seems to be hawkish. And I just wonder how long Kuroda and Co. are going to be able to hold on to that. And not blinking yet, Lisa. 144.46. Eric Nelson of Wales on this program yesterday. What did he say? 150. Yeah. Next up, 150. And a lot of people have said that the Bank of Japan is not going to blink until there is a little bit more dollar weakness. And right now, that doesn't seem to be in the How cards. How much yen weakness do they want to see before they blink? <laughs> I it's getting, mean, it's getting yeah. ridiculous, isn't it? Well, just because of the inflation that they're importing and what this does to them. So much of the inflation story has been oil and gas. And a lot of people have been calling for oil prices to surge to new record highs earlier this year. One person pushed against them. He said, you guys are all wrong. You underestimate the power of a lack of demand as the global economy slows. That one person was Ed Morse, Citigroup head of commodities research uh, for, the, for the world. And, and he came out and he said, no, prices are going down. Ed Morse, you were correct. We have seen that and we have seen it steadily uh, going, even with a potential supply cut from OPEC+. Plus. How closely is this particular energy story tied to the slowdown that we're seeing in China? Well, it's got a lot to do with it, but a lot less to do with it than people really think, because Chinese demand was really peaking, and we didn't expect it to go anywhere this year. We had a, a very low number, a modest 100,000 barrel a day uh, increase in Chinese demand. They, they came back to where they had been through the recovery, and there was no place further to go. They had already cut back on diesel demand, on gasoline demand. Their one bright spot was petrochemical feedstock. And as we know, a lot of that comes from the natural gas liquids pool rather than from the oil pool or the refinery pool. Uh, China has, however, really influenced the market. They are so concerned with energy security that they basically stopped exports. And that has had reverberations around the planet. The one thing that, that we missed, uh, and the world as a whole missed, was that uh, when we have natural gas prices getting as high as it, they've gone on a content, a BTU content basis, prices for gas, net gas, are higher than prices for diesel. At a time when the world was moving closer to diesel, we had demand up about a million barrels a day as a result of that switch. China cut off their exports of about 700,000 barrels a day of diesel. They did that last September. They haven't lifted it at all. So we were having you know, some of what's happening in the planet is really a result of China, but I say it's more of China policy than it is of Chinese demand. Ed, the fact that you say that it is less to do with China than people think is a pretty dire statement with respect to economic activity in the United Kingdom, in the European Union, as well as the United States, at a time when all regions are looking to support households as they continue to maintain their demand. So can you explain a little bit more why demand is falling off so much more than people seem to think from the data at hand? So on the, we, have the, we have the best data in the world from the United States. People saw, started seeing, we started seeing at the end of March, beginning of April, that U.S. demand really had come off. And it come off as we got out of winter and as we got into the driving season. And week after week, and even if you do it on a four-week moving average basis, from March to today, U.S. demand has gotten lower and lower than it was a year ago. Total demand in the month of August was close to 2 million barrels a day, lower than it was in August 2021. Um, 1 million barrels a day of that was in the transport fuel business, 300,000 in diesel, which reflects what's happening 
volumetrically in the retail market. The rest, the remaining 700,000 a day was in the gasoline market. And that's because people simply decided to drive less. We have survey data that prove that vehicle miles traveled have gone down. So, you know, get high prices and people re react to that by not buying as much. And that's, that's kind of a lesson potentially for Europe. We've seen effectively conservation working as a result of consumer response to high prices uh, across, across the United States without a recession other than the technical recession. But, you know, we're seeing growth in the labor market that's pretty formidable. And even so, with more money in people's pockets, people are driving less. That is a lesson. If you let the market work to some degree, people are going to conserve. So one of the big experiments that the world, Europe in particular, is confronting is how much will people be allowed to conserve? The other experiment is what's going to happen politically as people get more concerned about inflation in their pocketbook and jobs than they do about Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we have some elections coming up. In a couple of weeks, we have an election in Italy. And we'll see what the consumer rebellion might be uh, against where these high consumer prices are. Ed, just as you're speaking, we're hearing from the EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen talking about how the EU is going to propose a mandatory target for reducing peak electricity. Clearly, the kind of response uh, from government you're alluding to here. Yet, as Europe faces this winter, there is a sense that this isn't just going to be a this winter problem. We could see years of restricted supply in Europe. So when you're trying to model out natural gas prices and what they could look like, how persistently higher could they be? And is that something ultimately that the consumer is just going to have to tolerate? Yes, the question is not whether they're going to stay, these prices are going to stay higher, but how much higher will they stay? Europe is moving back to thermal, uh, to, to fossil fuels, both to natural gas and coal. Um, they've had a double hit this summer because a lot of nuclear reactors, particularly in France, had to be shut because of a lack of water for cooling the nuclear plants. Those will almost certainly be coming back. But as we look at Europe's move back to natural gas and the world's response, it will be somewhere between 2025 and 2027 that we'll see the prices in Europe coming back to where they were at the beginning of 2021. And one of the major difficulties that Europe is confronting is that it's not only seeing consumers hit in the pocketbook, but it's seeing job losses in energy intensive industries. And we're seeing those energy intensive industries migrating. And where are they migrating to? places in the world where energy costs are lower, namely the United States. We've seen the migration of fertilizers yeah. uh, into the U.S. from Europe, and we're seeing other energy intensive industries like zinc and aluminum smelting uh, slowing down or closing altogether. Well, but to that point, Ed, about migrating to the United States, what is the risk that these higher energy prices in Europe, the crisis there, is going to bleed through in a material mm -hmm. way to prices here in the United States? Well, the risk is not on the net gas side directly. It's actually through thermal coal and what's happening to thermal coal prices. When we got to $9 uh, and closer to $10 natural gas prices again, it wasn't because of our production. It wasn't because of our imports uh, from Canada. It was because the price of coal had shot up uh, as Europe bought more coal, as China bought more coal. And the $9 price of natural gas, now $8, but that was equivalent to where thermal coal prices were. And now... We're seeing thermal coal prices coming off again for a variety of reasons, and with that, U.S. nat gas. So U.S. nat gas is going to be seeing a significant increase in supply. We're going to see some boost in our LNG exports, but those are capped. We, you can only produce as much LNG as you have liquefaction capacity, and it doesn't grow overnight. And that's the reason why Europe's going to have to wait till mid or later in the decade to get to the point where there'll be enough nat gas particularly from the U.S. and Qatar, that's going to be able to replace that Russian natural gas. We also have to remember that the Russian game plan is not completely over. It's hard to second guess what Mr. Putin will do. He specifically said what they're doing on oil and gas, but particularly gas at the moment, is a reflection of price caps being discussed. Mm -hmm. um, Russia's going to be you know, running out of places to sell gas pretty soon. Uh, European destination of gas from Russia, other than a bit of liquefied natural gas, can't go anywhere else in the world. There's only a certain modest level of switching they can do to sell gas by pipeline to other countries. Those are mostly former Soviet Union countries, and their, their demand is limited. So 
the uh, uh, 30 BCM of, uh, of nat gas that Europe is uh, being provided for by, uh, by Russia is not going to be replaced by another market. So at some point, uh, Russia might say, hey, we want to maximize the revenue we're getting from natural gas. It would not be surprising if they turned back the flows on natural gas as we got to the end of the injection season in Europe, uh, got to the point when Europe is going to be growing storage, when prices will be high for the winter and Russia will make a lot of money on it. Ed, so that's one thing to watch. Just fascinating yeah. stuff, Ed, as we all try and work out whether we have to do this again next winter. Ed Moss of Citigroup. Ed, thank you, sir, as always. And just to recap those comments from the EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, speaking to reporters just moments ago, Kaylee, to propose a mandatory target for reducing peak electricity. What do you make of that? They're trying to reduce demand, to your point earlier, John, about, yes, we can take all of this action on the supply side on trying to cap, but does that just continue to feed into people demanding electricity? How do you bring that down? The other interesting headline for me, the EU, is to facilitate liquidity support for energy companies. Does that just mean, you know, give them more money? More money. Lisa, it's all coming together very slowly, isn't it? It's coming together, but it's an imperfect picture, as Ed Morris was saying, because it just feeds into even more demand. I've got to talk about some of this with the man himself, Richard Haas, President of the Council on Foreign Relations, on a difficult moment for foreign relations from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Vladimir Putin re predicted Russia will emerge stronger from the invasion of Ukraine. He told the forum in Vladivostok, quote, we've lost nothing and won't lose anything. Putin also lashed out at what he called U.S. and European sanctions fever in response to the war. Deutsche Bank CEO Christian Saving says that Germany is headed toward a recession. Saving told a conference in Frankfurt that energy prices will stay high for some time, creating the threat to the economy. Now, the EU is trying to come up with ideas to keep the energy crisis from turning into an economic meltdown. California narrowly avoided blackouts for a second day in a row. For several hours late Tuesday, the state imposed its highest level of energy emergency. Consumers were urged to turn off their lights and curb air conditioners. Triple-digit temperatures pushed demand for electricity to a record. Authorities are preparing for more pressure on the power system today. The price of oil is now at the lowest level since January. Concern about global demand escalated. Plus, the dollar surged to a record. That makes oil more expensive outside the U.S. West Texas Intermediate fell toward $85 a barrel. The Spanish oil and gas giant Repsol is making a dramatic shift away from fossil fuels. It's selling a quarter of its exploration and production division to U.S. private equity firm EIG Global Energy Partners. The price? $3.4 billion. Repsol is raising funds to help pay for low-emission projects while reducing its cost of capital. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I will deal hands-on with the energy crisis caused by Putin's war. I will take action this week to deal with energy bills and to secure our future energy supply. Can you imagine what her inbox looks like on the first day, Bramo? Welcome to work. Welcome to hell. Liz Truss, <laughs> I mean... the UK Prime Minister, with a lot of work to do. Alongside Katie Lyons and Lisa Brambert, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures firmer by a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, up two tenths of 1%. Yields lower by a couple of basis points. Your tenure this morning, 3.32.64. We get lucky this morning. Joining us now is Richard Haas, the President of the Council on Foreign Relations and author of the book The Bill of Obligations, coming out early next year. Richard, always great to catch up with you, sir. I've seen the latest article in Foreign Affairs magazine, the title, The Dangerous Decade. I think we need to start there, Richard. Why is this decade going to be so much more dangerous than what we saw in the previous decade? It's a fair question. The, the short answer is that it's an imperfect storm. You've got three things taking place simultaneously. One, you've got the reemergence of, of large-scale, historic-scale geopolitical tensions between Europe and the United States on one hand, and then with Russia, with China, also with Iran. Secondly, you've got all sorts of global challenges, such as climate change, uh, infectious disease, where there's a large gap between the threat and the willingness of the world to come together. And then thirdly, all of this is taking place, Jonathan, against the backdrop 
of a United States that's divided, distracted, both figuratively and literally at war with itself. And there's a real question about whether the United States will be willing and able to play the significant role that it's played for the last three quarters of a century. So you add those three, three things up, and I would say anyone watching this show has to assume that going forward, there's going to be far more turbulence, far more instability in the world than looking backwards. From a business uh, case, what does this mean in terms of doing business in China, of the increasingly tight relationship between China and Russia, and what kind of international presence is to be expected given some of these backdrops? Well, for Russia, so long as Mr. Putin's in charge, you've got to assume there's dr draconian sanctions. I think with China, you've got to assume at a minimum that there's more restrictive sanctions in anything dealing with technology in either direction. Plus, I also think there's going to be a major policy conversation in, in the West, also not just in Europe, but in places like Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, the United States, about whether it's wise to remain so dependent on the ability to export to China and import from China. You would have thought that one of the lessons of the, of the current conflict with Russia is that any form of economic dependence, not just energy, de energy dependence, confers leverage on the other side. We are now providing China with enormous potential leverage should, for example, over the next few years, there be a conflict over Taiwan. So I think you've also got to expect a slightly more downsized overall economic relationship with China and the sort of thing you're seeing in the United States, the CHIPS Act. Uh, bringing home certain types of productive activity, I think, is a, is a reaction both to the, the turbulence of supply chains, plus, again, growing uncertainty about relations with countries like, like China. Is this a government uh, option, or is this something that each business has to decide for themselves? And I ask this because a lot of people have been surprised that there hasn't been more exodus from China, from manufacturing there by U.S. businesses, given some of the fragilities exposed by the pandemic and by some of the increasing tensions. No, it's a good question. I think some businesses are living in la-la land. They're essentially hoping against hope. They don't face a much more uh, dis disturbed environment politically with China, that China doesn't face all sorts of internal issues. But uh, I would think that any business now needs to right-size, which i.e. downsize, uh, its relationship with China. It can't assume that there, there's going to be business as usual there. Again, anyone in the technology space, for sure. But even those beyond sensitive technologies have to assume that if there's geopolitical friction with China, and you'd have to bet there's a decent chance there it will be, sanctions will be introduced that will be broader than technology. So I think any business that doesn't have a plan B and hasn't begun to move towards it vis-a-vis uh, -vis China is putting itself into a position of distinct vulnerability. Obviously, Richard, and it's Kaylee in New York, from the perspective of the United States, they are looking outward at China and the geopolitical tensions that you are highlighting at the same time that there is a sense that there's a very real democratic crisis inward internally in the United States. And I'm just wondering if kind of threats to democracy domestically hamper the United States' ability to tackle those geopolitical challenges moving forward, especially when midway through the decade you say is going to be so dangerous, we could have a new president inaugurated. You're absolutely right, Kelly. You know, we're going to have a new president at some point. Uh, what we don't know any longer is what that president's going to do when it comes to its, the U.S. relationship with the world. I say that because in the old days, no matter who was elected president, you had a pretty good sense of the parameters of what this individual would do. That's not true anymore. We now have the potential to lurch dramatically. That means our allies are much more uh, guarded about being so reliant or dependent on us. It means our foes may see, may see opportunities. What we did in Afghanistan, I expect, did influence Mr. Putin to do what he did in, in Ukraine. I think it's, it could be harder to drum up resources for sustained American involvement in the world because so much uh, of our attention is going to be turned uh, inward. I expect in certain areas uh, the partisanship will infect foreign policy as it has. You're going to see, for example, a very rough debate over uh, Iran potentially if the United States tries to re-enter the agreement with it. So going forward, it's going to be harder to conduct a, a consistent foreign policy against this backdrop, much less promote democracy in the world. How are we going to say, be like us, 
given what's happening with our politics, given the fact that life expectancy is going down in, in the United States. We've had all the problems with lost academic time because of uh, how we manage COVID. So the American model, shall we say, is not quite the shining city on a hill that we would like it to be. Richard, just to finish up then, what's the solution? Do you think we need new institutions to come to some kind of collective agreement in the West on how to deal with these issues? What is the solution? First thing, I never, ever, ever use the word solution. These are not problems that are going to be solved or fixed. If we're lucky, we'll be able to manage them uh, more than and less. And yes, to some extent, that might mean new solutions. It might mean different pol new, new, new uh, institutions, new policies, new behaviors. But there's no solutions. History doesn't doesn't offer those uh, you know, frequently. And we're not going to get solutions now. That's a worrying conclusion to this conversation, Richard, but a bit of a reality check for everyone, too. Richard Haas, thank you, of the Council on Foreign Relations. Lisa, on the day that we're talking about Apple launching a new iPhone, I don't think it's lost on anyone that they probably fit in quite neatly into the conversation we've just had. There was a Wall Street Journal article in the past couple of days talking about how Apple at first tried to move some of the supply chain out of China and then realized how difficult it was and then doubled down on increasing the presence in that nation. The nation has done a very good job of creating, becoming the factory to the world and how companies really move away and whether they build and they invest in the infrastructure to do so has yet to be seen in any kind of real meaningful way, at least according to a lot of people The out warnings there. you hear from people like Richard Haas there on China make me think back to the warnings I used to hear about companies in Russia maybe eight, nine, ten years ago. And you just wonder whether we end up in the same place. In Foreign Affairs magazine, The Dangerous Decade, the author Richard Haas. Take a look. Coming up, Emily Rowland, co-chief investment strategist at John Hancock Investment Management with futures up a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P from New York City. This is Bloomberg. The simple thing that foreign exchange is signaling right now is that the U.S. economy is faring better than the rest of the world. Right now, the U.S. is in somewhat better shape than Europe. It's further away from Ukraine. It's less exposed to the inflation. The ECB, obviously, in the near term, is going to tighten, but it's highly, highly unlikely that the Eurozone can avoid a recession. Right now, the dollar strength is as much a good thing as it is a bad thing. I think the recession in Europe and the energy crisis that is brewing is something investors cannot ignore. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Katie likes cruises. There are <laughs> rules to appearing on this show. No one likes cruises. I thought Seriously. that was the agreement, Bramo. You're not allowed to come Katie, on. Katie revealing she likes cruises. Katie lines in the seat. TK's away. Bramo alongside us. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures up a tenth of 1%. Good morning, good morning, just in case you missed the tagline. Bramo, equity's turning around a little bit, but over the last seven days, this hasn't been pretty for this NASDAQ at all. It has been on the heels of a lot of hawkish discussion, not only from the Federal Reserve, but also the ECB tomorrow, expected to possibly raise rates by 75 basis points. This was unheard of just a few months ago, just a few weeks ago, and now it's a base case for an increasing number of people followed on by two 50 basis point rate hikes for the remainder of the year. Kind of shocking considering the negative rates of not so long ago. What do you make of scheduling? I think it's kind of ridiculous that the ECB has pushed back its news conference to try and accommodate the US data that comes out at 8.30 Eastern time. And then Chairman Powell has just dropped an address, a speech in the middle of the ECB presser. I wonder if that gets changed over the next 24 hours. Well, do you think it's deliberate that he's trying to mask himself and basically try to de-emphasize any kind of discussion or that he has? Or give cover to Lagarde. Institute? Yeah, or is he, he's trying to like <laughs> overshadow Christine Lagarde and give her, a, you know, a punt for something that's very difficult. I think that the bottom line is that it's unclear to me what's going to be more important for markets, tomorrow's ECB meeting or Friday's confab with all of the energy ministers from Europe in terms of how they're going to deal with some of the energy crises. To me, that might be a bigger market mover at this point Could not agree than more. a 75 Could basis point Could not agree hike. more. If you can tell me what's going to happen with gas prices, Katie Lines, mm -hmm. I've got a much, much better picture of what next year looks like for this economy and for that matter for this ECB. The question is whether or not that clear picture is actually going to materialize when they face such a great challenge on the gas side with the unknown on supply and then also questions about how they might be able to rein in demand if they also are capping prices that people have to pay, thereby allowing them potentially to afford more electricity. It's a problem in the U.K. as well and one that Liz Truss is going to have to probably speak to as she's speaking in her first PMQs as prime minister in parliament right now. What is Keir Starmer going to have to ask her about? Uh, good luck to her and good luck. I think it's one of those occasions where Sir Keir Starmer 
Lisa just has to let the new Prime Minister do the talking because they're in a very, very tough spot right now. Can you believe that someone wanted this job? I mean, honestly, would you want to be Prime Minister right now of the United Kingdom? I used to think that Theresa May had a tough <laughs> hand when she became the Prime Minister of the UK. Perhaps this is even tougher at the moment, Elisa. Going back to the pandemic, I think we often used to say how brave these policymakers were to do these massive things. The bond market was wide open to do massive things. And I don't think you have to be brave to go max dovish at a central bank when inflation is low. It's much more complicated to calibrate the right policy response when monetary policy and fiscal policy is almost in conflict with each other. And the decision now you've got to make is not the optimal policy decision. Something Mohamed El Arian said a month or so ago, Lisa, you've got to come up with the least worst decision. And that's pretty tough to be a policymaker when that's the decision you've got to make. And perhaps this explains why a conservative leader is coming up with some of the biggest spending plans that they've ever seen, as well as a whole host of other financial support for households around the country. Everything can turn on its head. Yields climbing in the UK over the last week or so. I can tell you they're backing away this morning, just a little bit lower. You see that in Treasuries as well. Let's whip through the price action for your futures up a tenth of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq, up around about a tenth of 1% as well. The yields lower in the US too. We're down two basis points on a 10-year to 332.83. I can tell you the dollar, strong, strong, strong. Euro dollar 98.92, negative a tenth of 1% on that currency pair. Lisa, we're coming really close to 145 on dollar yen. Yeah. Higher the session right now, 144. 80. And it keeps climbing. Where is the breaking point? And this has been a discussion point for a long time as we got to 130, 135, 140. And now yet again, even as the Bank of Japan doubled down, doubles down on its uh, position with monetary policy. What I'm watching today, 10 a.m., the Bank of Canada rate decision. The Bank of Canada has been out front. And this is important to say. They have been the first mover among the developed market economy. They're expected to raise rates by 50 or 75 basis points. The likelihood of a 75 basis point hike is probably even more. And this comes at a time where rates are at the highest levels and heading toward the higher levels uh, seen since 2008. What is the road path ahead? We're not going to get much guidance from them, but perhaps we'll get some sort of indication of how Bank of Canada is leading with a slew of Fed speak. We get Fed uh, speakers, Richmond Fed President Thomas Barkin at 9 a.m., Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester at 10 a.m., Vice Chair Lael Brainerd around 12.30 p.m., and, uh, and Vice Chair of Supervision Michael Barr speaking at 2 p.m., the same time the Beige Book is released. How much pain are they willing to see, and are they willing to go further because people have actually been going out and spending more? And again, this goes to the theme of the entire morning, John, and I feel like we have to keep harping on this. When you support gas prices, when you get them lower, people can spend more, and all of a sudden monetary policy workers have to worry about inflation all the more so and come out and double down. And to me, that's a huge concern. It's anyway. a massive concern for me. Yeah, it's I mean, a that's huge a, concern. Can you yeah. imagine trying to set policy for the next 12 months, this trying is what, to work all this out? This is what Ed Morris was talking about. Today we've got the Barclays CEO Energy Conference taking place in New York City. Our own Alex Steele interviewing Ryan Lance of ConocoPhillips, Mike Worth of Chevron, David Hager of Devon Energy. How do these executives see the path of oil and gas going forward, given some of the support, given some of the calls for windfall taxes, and given the fact that it's very unclear how much demand is falling off a cliff in response to some of the slowdowns engineered by monetary policymakers. Ramo, thank you. Liz Truss right on cue. I'm against a windfall tax. Kelly lines that headline just drop in moments ago. Yep, saying a windfall tax will put companies off from investing. So you don't want to have a windfall tax, John. How else do you pan plan to pay for potentially 200 billion pounds in support for energy companies and consumers? I'd go a step further. Let's think about what that price cap is actually doing. Yeah. You're capping the prices for consumers and then paying the energy companies the difference. And at the same time, you're not curtailing demand. So prices against that kind of backdrop, Kaylee, you'd imagine would stay elevated. So essentially, they're just giving money to the energy suppliers, yeah. aren't they? And then at the same time saying, we're not going to tax them more. <laughs> this is going to be difficult. The detail of this effort in the UK, yeah. I think it's going to be really, really hard to put together. Well, and she says she's going to make a parliament statement tomorrow, Thursday, on the energy plan, so we'll get some more clarity. But everything you just said, John, yes, totally true, very valid questions. There's also the question of does this then just fuel inflation further, and where is that going to leave Andrew Bailey in the Bank of England? As Hugh Pill today says, yeah, 22% inflation, it's plausible. You know when Liz Truss should do that announcement? Just around the, the Garden Eastern. Chairman <laughs> Palace, somewhere in between, just because no one else is looking at the schedule at all, aren't they? It's ridiculous, Bramo. <laughs> Tell them what tell time them. to do these things. It's ridiculous. Emily Rowland joins us now, co-chief investment strategist at John Hancock Investment Management. 
Emily, let's start with Europe and think about the contagion, the channel for contagion from Europe to the United States. What do you think the, the main channel is? Is it financial? Is it economic? What do you think it is? Well, I think currency is a big, you know, element here. Clearly, we've seen the dollar continuing to strengthen here, and that is tightening financial conditions. It's creating ripple effects across assets. You know, I think what's going on right now in Europe, frankly, is confusing. Uh, you've laid it out well over the last couple of days. There's this massive conflict now between tighter monetary policy and now a bazooka of fiscal stimulus potentially coming on to the tune of 5% of GDP in Europe. And those two things just really don't go together. I don't know if you've noticed the guests that you've had on the last few days and you guys, there's kind of this wide-eyed, you know, sort of, you know, chuckle when it comes to the idea that the ECB is going to raise rates by 75 basis points tomorrow at the same time that these potential gas caps are going to come online. How do we pay for that? given the fact that supply of oil is so limited, does it come in the form of a weaker currency and higher sovereign bond yields in Europe? You know, what are the impacts of that? This is a pretty meaningful move here. And one of the big reassessments in markets has been the resolve of central banks to raise rates into weakness, into these concerns about funding costs, which has led a real division on Wall Street of those who believe Fed officials, who believe ECB officials when they say, we're not going to blank, we're going to keep raising rates and we're going to keep them there. And then others who say, we don't buy it, you are going to cut rates in the very near future once again. Emily, where do you stand and why? Yeah, Lisa, we're in a late cycle environment right now where we see this push and pull happening. We're going from inflation concerns to growth concerns. There's sort of a macro battle going on in the background right now. And eventually the Fed usually does win out in the form of slower growth and eventually a recession. So we do think that Central banks need to move aggressively over the course of this year. We agree with the bond market's assessment of that and the stock market. Um, you know, everybody's sort of ig ignoring this, the fact that inflationary pressures in the U.S. Mm -hmm. are clearly coming off the boil and pricing in a very, very aggressive Fed from here. We think ultimately growth is slowing. We're seeing it in some of the leading indicators, areas like housing. The Fed is looking at backward-looking economic data. We're all friends on this show, and we've talked about friends. Don't let friends use backward-looking economic data. <laughs> and as we look forward here, you know, we see that we're just beginning to see this slowdown. We're just beginning to see the impact of Fed tightening actually transmitted into the economy. Yeah. We think the economic gets, data gets worse before it gets better. Not a great time here to be loading up on risk, and we think bonds okay. are actually attractive. Yeah, I know you love bonds, Emily. I'm wondering if you've gotten your T-shirt yet. But when it comes to the not equity yet. market, given everything you just said, is the bottom not in yet? Uh, I just don't think that the risk reward looks very attractive in this market right now. You know, stocks are still trading at fairly elevated levels. And frankly, we have not seen the impact of Fed tightening on earnings estimates yet. I just looked this morning at next 12-month earnings growth, and they're just sort of flattening out. We haven't seen earnings growth estimates roll over yet. I think that that's something that happens into 2023. Again, we want to own some parts of the equity market. You know, we like higher quality companies, more defensive equities, areas that are going to benefit from this change in consumer behavior away from the things that we want and towards the things that we need. But we just don't think this is a great time to load up on cyclical companies, ones that need to tap the capital markets in order to grow. Yeah. And that's exactly what a lot of investors have been doing. Emily, does your iPhone magically slow down when the new one comes out? <laughs> My goodness. So I just wanted to know, does it? Oh, no. It's going to slow I down. I don't know. That's what happens. Yeah, she's just like, like, why are you asking the me this? <laughs> just, just asking if other people experience the same thing. You're Lisa. leading the new witness. New iPhone comes out. You are leading the witness. iPhone slows she was down. Like, why should I answer this? It I'm happens. Emily Rowland, thank you. I from John Hancock okay. Investment Management. She might be long Apple. Maybe that's why she couldn't <laughs> oh, talk about it. Oh, so you're going to spread a rumor Perhaps. now about no, her? No, I'm just saying oh might, my goodness. Be. Oh, might be. Might oh be. Goodness. Future's up a 10. Look at those markets. From New York, this is Bloomberg. <laughs> I think Jonathan's up to something, yes. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. U.S. officials say that Russia wants to buy millions of rockets and artillery shells from North Korea. It's the latest sign that Moscow is being pressured by international sanctions. There's no indication that any weapons sales have been completed. Last month, the CIA said Russia had approached Iran to buy armed drones. Russia's Vladimir Putin and China's Xi Jinping will meet next week in Uzbekistan. That's according to a Russian official. The trip would be Xi's first foreign journey in two and a half years. 
Putin and Xi met in Beijing in February, weeks before the Kremlin sent troops into Ukraine. They signed an agreement saying that relations between the two countries would have no limits. There was a report that one of the documents seized at Donald Trump's Florida residence describes a foreign government's nuclear weapons capabilities. Now, that's according to The Washington Post. The newspaper also says that some of the documents discuss closely guarded top secret U.S. operations. A warning from J.P. Morgan Chase. The cost of living crisis in the U.K. has only just begun. Retail analysts at the bank say consumer spending on discretionary items may shrink by mid-single-digit percentage next year. That's even if the U.K. energy price cap is frozen. And new research says that about half of U.S. workers could be described as quiet quitters. That is, they fulfill their job description but are psychologically detached from their work. The polling firm Gallup surveyed more than 15,000 workers. Gallup says most quiet quitters are looking for another job. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Ultimately, the president's going to do everything that we can to make sure that gas prices keep heading in the right direction, which include a number of things like the price cap, which is ultimately set up in a way that reduces Russia's revenues but allows oil to flow in order to make sure that we don't have a spike in prices. Wally Adeyama there, the U.S. Deputy Treasury Secretary, speaking to Bloomberg in the last 24 hours. Bramo, just as soon as that was announced at the end of the week last week, all of a sudden Nord Stream 1's not reopening, got output cuts over at OPEC+. Plus. Coincidental or not? It you was know, part of the conversation over the weekend. For sure. And I'm not going to weigh in necessarily uh, sure. whether it was a coincidence or not. The bottom line is there is a confluence of issues pressuring the energy story that does not seem to be going away and seems to only be getting worse. Lisa Bram, it's alongside Kelly Lines. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures right now up a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq up a tenth of 1% also. Yields down two or three basis points, 332.26. Euro dollar basically unchanged and just about holding on to 99. We've been looking at dollar yen all morning. 144.73. Higher the session, 144. 4480. Kelly lines were getting closer and closer to 145. It is remarkable, John. We haven't seen these kind of levels on dollar yen going all the way back to 1998. And we know at that time, intervention was involved. And we've gotten some verbal intervention from Japanese policymakers. Clearly, they are worried about the weak levels we are seeing on the Japanese yen. And yet Kuroda doesn't really seem to think it is enough of a problem at this point for him to change course, hike rates or abandon yield curve control. We'll pick up on dollar CNH as well. 698.93, higher the session 699.71. Came really, really close to a seven handle. Liz Truss, the new prime minister in the UK, is facing down her first PMQs in parliament right now. She will make a statement in parliament Thursday on an energy plan. Just yesterday, I believe, she had a call with the president of the United States. Let's get to AMH down in DC. Has that call taken place, Anne-Marie? And what do they talk about? Yeah, the call's taken place. They talked about the obvious issues like China, Iran, to your point, Jonathan. They also talked about making sure they can collaborate in terms of securing um, energy, especially as the UK right now is dealing with these sky high prices. And then another point that is of interest is, of course, the fact that they talked about the Good Friday Agreement and making sure that that stays in place. This is something really near and dear to President Joe Biden, an individual that really likes to talk about his roots and his background as an Irish American. Of course, the worry is, of course, if there's any UK government policy that can upend that. And it could be a little bit awkward given the fact that Liz Truss, the new prime minister, just over a year ago, she said that this special relationship is special but not exclusive and kind of talked about the fact that it shouldn't be like a beauty pageant who's going to cozy up like a teenage girl to the United States. Could be a bit of an awkward moment if the two were to meet at the UN General Assembly later this September. But obviously, both of these countries rely on each other and have a deep uh, history and shared interests. How reliable has the U.S. been as an ally both to the U.K. and the European Union, especially as we head into this energy crisis? Well, the United States has really been trying to make sure they can shore up all of the support on the European continent in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And that is something that now we're really all starting to grapple with the questions of the policies that were enacted by the United States and its partners, uh, all in alliance on this. Is that going to now really hurt 
European economies the most and what can the U.S. do to make sure that they stay in place. I mean, Jen Soltenberg today in the Financial Times in this opinion piece really sets it straight, saying it's going to be a really tough six months and how do we keep this unity alive and even alludes to the fact that we can have civil unrest because this is going to hurt these European economies much worse than it's going to hurt the United States. And Marie, does the fact that the midterms are now so close, we're within two months away, and therefore people may be looking more internally domestically in the United States, impact what the United States is likely to do for its allies? Well, I think it definitely impacts also the messaging you're going to see, right? The president has been in Wisconsin. He was in Pennsylvania three times in one week. He's going to Ohio. You have Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen going to Detroit. They are on the campaign trail, and they are trying to make sure that they show that their policies should, uh, should be the ones that continue. They were able to get gasoline prices down, and that they, want, they are really trying to draw a line between them and what they call ultra-MAGA Republicans in some of these very contested races. I think at this moment, you do still see the United States wanting to make sure they are helping their European allies and also Ukraine as well. We're going to have a stopgap funding measure. And what the White House is asking for is a nearly $12 billion in more aid for Ukraine when it comes to defense and also some money for U.S. energy. So you'll hear about it. It'll still be in the news, but it's not going to be front page news, right? Because the U.S. certainly is going to start looking a lot more internally and a lot of these races are going to get very heated and we're very close to those November elections. Amory, you mentioned something there. They help get gas prices down. Can we sit on that just for one further question? There has been a monster SPR release. AMH, what do you think happens now that a lot of that is behind us? Well, one thing, Jonathan, if for this money they're requesting for in Ukraine aid, some of that money would go to U.S energy uh, infrastructure, a revamp, really, of the SPR. It was a monster SPR. They talk about it all the time, but they can't continue to tap it. You know, the one thing on the U.S. side that they probably won't like to say out loud is the fact that China is still dealing with a COVID zero policy, which means they have had demand destruction since the COVID outbreak. Once China comes roaring back, it could be very difficult uh, for this administration, especially when those EU sanctions kick in in terms of the shipping and the insurance on that Russian crude. And then, of course, the fact that the SPR, they're not going to be able to really tap again the same way they have been. So it can be incredibly difficult. But at the moment now, you do see a trend lower. I'm not going to say that's just on the SPR the United States would like to say, but obviously it's on a number of issues, especially the fact that people are worried about a recession and, of course, what's happening in China. AMH, thank you. Amory Hodder and Dan in D.C., one of the best. Good to catch up with her. At least on that point, SPR has been worked down by a massive amount. You've got this backdrop in OPEC Plus where they're worried about a lack of spare capacity and they've cut supply into a market that they think is not really picking up on some of these issues. Where do you think we are now? Well, and Ed Morris coming out and actually confirming that and saying that it's really the U.S. and Europe, not just China, where the lack of demand is. We just want to put some numbers on this, okay? The Strategic Petroleum Reserve has moved down to its lowest level since 1984. It is down about 24 percent so far this year, very much at a record in terms of the pace of the decline in this, which raises an issue of, A, how much further they can go, and B, what is the capability of dealing with another crisis should it arise? We're crude right now. 93. Do you think this was a crisis this year? Um, it was a crisis of confidence and political political oh, political crisis. Sure. You'd both call it that. Well, I mean, we, okay. What would you say? I, I'm I'm asking a question. Should you be using the SBR for a political is you, crisis? Is your iPhone just slowing down? Is that what's going it's on? It's getting slower yeah, by it's getting the second. Slower by, yeah, like just <laughs> you hacking it. Yeah, clearly, obviously, it's my fault. <laughs>
eight to nine percentage points down every single day over the last seven days. And yet still, the bears out there aren't interested. Emily Rowland of John Hancock just about 30 minutes ago said she wants to see more cuts to earnings estimates. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley started off the week saying exactly the same thing. HSBC and Max Kettner, he is still max underweight, this equity market. Still trying to work out what max underweight actually means from Max Kettner, but I'll talk to him about that the next time he comes on. HSBC making a call on this bond market as well on the 10-year. The high of the year on the 10-year was just south of 350 on June 14th. Not a million miles away right now at 332. On a 10-year, yields come at about two or three basis points. Steve Major of HSBC goes from 250 to 3% on the 10-year year-end. Bit of marking to market, maybe, but ultimately just speaks to the fact that even the big bond bulls are capitulating still at this point of the year because they think ultimately yields aren't going to come down that much from here. On a two-year, we have seen the highs of the year. At the close yesterday, 346.19 is where we are right now. We come back by about four basis points. The dollar-dominant story, though, off the back of what's happening in the bond market and what's happening with this Fed is at the epicenter of things right now. And not just in G10 with dollar yen, it's ripping right the way through. Asia elsewhere. Dollar yen, though, is one to watch. Line of the sand for us all, 145. Just south of that right now, 144.77. Positive, 1.4%. And, Katie, I think you've said it all morning. You've got to go back to the summer of 1998 to see a Japanese yen this week. And yet, what does the Japanese BOJ do overnight, John? Buy more bonds. Boost Unreal. their bond buying because they're still maintaining yield curve control and 25 basis points is the target. For how long? Not blinking. They are not blinking. That's the cross asset price action. With a look at Apple now, we can get to Bramo. <laughs> hey, Lisa. I'm going to rename this for this uh, segment that this is the barely moving or not really that much moving because nothing is really moving all that much. There has not been that much action, even under the hood, of the indexes, which are barely positive. But I am looking at certain energy companies in the U.S. that are gaining despite the fact that you see crude prices falling, and that includes Occidental and Exxon. Some people talking about the Warren Buffett premium because he has favored some of these stocks. Those shares up. 0.3% and 0.4% respectively. I know people are going to write in and say that's not a mover. That's like a, basically a stasis, but it's moving a little bit more than other things. Uh, Valero also uh, gaining today up 1.2%. GameStop earnings come out after the bell. We are watching what happens. Those shares down ahead of that, down 1% on the heels of some expectations for some hardware woes as well as they're going to get into crypto assets. Kind of bad timing. And that seems to be weighing on a stock that has been whipsawed all over the place in the meme world. Apple, yes, we're going to be talking about that poll. And Kaylee, you can tell us what's going to happen right now. The share is up four tenths of a percent before they unleash Apple 14. John, I'm sorry, I'm not going to weigh in on the conspiracy. And perhaps <laughs> I'm just not sensitive enough to notice the incremental slowdown of the drip, drip water you said torture. it was a conspiracy. I'm just saying what my experience is. <laughs> Don't deny my experience. OK, so then do you buy a new one every single time? No. I just okay. complain about my slow iPhone. You know, and I think that this is a fair complaint that some people say with updates and what's that's, the concern. That's all I'm here for. It's not yeah. analysis. It's not to go through the commentary on the south side. It's just to complain about things that, <laughs> just to complain. that bother me. I love it. That's what we should put on our Twitter handles. My Isn't job that is what Tom does? Hasn't Tom made a career out of that? Of complaining? It's, it's just, true. He's just on this show complaining. I think he's taken off to grow a beard and possibly plan a trip. And United Airlines also not moving that much considering the fact that they actually upgraded some of their forecasts on a higher demand. Do you know that this was the busiest weekend, even surpassing pre-pandemic norms, John, uh, over the Labor Day vacation? So I'm just saying. There is some optimism still I, out there. I agree. I saw the same headline, actually. Yeah. And I can confirm that United is now Tom's preferred airline to fly with. I've heard about this uh, more, than, more than three or four times. You got yeah. sick of BA. Yeah. <laughs> yes. These are personal preferences. There are other airlines available for you if you want to fly with them, just to stay out of trouble. News you can use. <laughs> just the small print there, Lisa. OK. Thank you. <laughs> Greg Staples with us now, head of fixed income for North America, DWS Group. Greg, getting closer and closer to the highs of the year on a 10-year at a time where everyone has told me that we've seen the highs of the year. Have we seen the highs of the year I on a 10-year? So. Uh, John, I don't think so. Every, I think everybody's wrong. We're seeing, obviously, the two-year break through that 3.50%, probably sometime today. And the 10-year, yeah, we're 15 basis points floating away from where we were on June 14th, June 15th. But I think with the momentum here and what's going on in Europe, we're going to see the 75 basis point probably tightening from the ECB. On Thursday, and of course, the uh, CPI number next week, I think we probably challenged that 3.5% and break through it. Is that the dominant driver here, Greg, is coming from Europe? I think that's something that's definitely influencing the U.S. markets. It was an impact yesterday along with the, uh, the uh, PMIs, but uh, all in, I think it's a bearish market and rates are going up globally. 
Well, how much of it also has to do with the credit side and the issuance that we're getting? Because it seemed that the narrative yesterday was that that had a lot to do with it. These corporations sprinting to the market as yields maybe are looking like they're going to keep going higher. I definitely was a catalyst for the move yesterday. Also was the ISM numbers. But I think all in, you're seeing higher rates going globally. I think you're seeing um, inflation in the United States still increasing. It's going to be a real problem until the Fed gets their arms around the demand side. And some of what they've done so far actually starts to impact Main Street. So how much cash do you want to have right now? What's you your recommendation? Mass, Kaylee, you want to have massive amounts of cash. If ever there's a time to build liquidity, it's right now. For two reasons. One is because it's very difficult to raise liquidity if you have to sell assets and put cash into your, into your portfolio. It's getting tougher and tougher, particularly in the fixed income markets. We're measuring even treasury liquidity is starting to get thin as the impact of QT starts to work its th th way through the treasury market. And overall, we think that there's going to be opportunities. There's potentially going to be the kind of gaps that you saw yesterday with uh, yields down 15 basis points and good up, up 15 basis points and strong issuance in the new issue market, as you point out. You want to have liquidity to be able to take advantage of that when that happens. Greg, can we quantify massive amounts of cash? Have you ever had more cash than you have now? Do you have half your portfolio in ultra liquid assets? Can you give us a sense of what that means? Well, it really depends on the portfolio's objectives overall. We definitely have some longer-term corporate bond portfolios. We're not going to be 100 percent in cash in that, but 5 or 10 percent at least at a minimum, and we're actually shading duration a little bit light as well, thinking that, uh, if anything, we're going to probably see the next move in steepening in the yield curve, and you want to be uh, further in on the yield curve, and you're going to be rewarded with those higher yields in the two-, three-, and five-year maturities as well. So uh, just I'm wondering about credit. Do you think it's still a leading indicator, or do you think that it's a lagging one that moves in tandem with stocks? I think it, I think it moves in tandem with stocks. Usually the way it works is the riskiest assets are the ones that underperform first. Talking about down in capital structure and high yield, the triple Cs to the single Bs, then it will work its way up to double Bs and into investment grade. I have to admit we think long-term fundamentals for investment grade credit are still quite strong, and they are also for a higher quality, high yield space. We'd be a little more concerned down in quality, but first I'd look for a break in the equity markets as well as increased volatility, and then that will work its way through to the IG market. We're quite conservative there as well. Well, I want to sit on this for a minute, Greg, because we were speaking yesterday with Ben Laidler, who pointed to credit spreads hanging in there as a reason to be bullish on stocks. Traditionally, this has been something that a lot of equity investors will look at. They'll say, the credit market leads. Why is this time different? Why is it not going to lead, and is it going to lag and move in tandem with other risk assets? I think for us it's as much liquidity and technicals as it is anything else. I mean, certainly we're looking at an economic slowdown. We don't think that that's going to have a very negative effect, effect overall in credit markets. But it is going to lead to shift in capital, and we're going to see less appetite for that kind of, kind of credit spreads that we're seeing now. All in, it's just a question of technicals, increased supply. I guess it's, I should take it as a contrary indicator yesterday that corporate uh, treasurers were looking to this open window to push massive amounts of uh, corporate debt into the marketplace. I think there's a perception there that perhaps this window is not going to be open for a long period of time. And John, I just go back to this idea that if credit is not the leading indicator and if credit breaking is what's going to cause the Fed to reverse course and actually move away from rate hikes, that perhaps that will not kick in as quickly to save equities this time around as it has in the past. You heard what Greg just said there that rallies were things to be sold yeah. and that sell-offs aren't necessarily things to be, buy, to be bought. Greg, is that the case for you? Because I just got a message from a Bloomberg subscriber who's basically asking the 350 a buy if we get back up there. I think we touched that, but I, I think you're going to have opportunistic uh, ability to take advantage of other issuances. We get past 350. Longer term, probably come back down again. I don't think this is a situation where we're going back up to 4 percent. And I also don't think it's a situation where you're going to see a breakdown overall in terms of, of, of corporate uh, uh, credit the way we did say in March of 2020. But I think you've just got to pick your spots very, very carefully. And I think watch, watching carefully, because you've got this, this three-legged stool. You've got Fed policy action, then you've got market reaction, and then you've got real-time Main Street economic data and it's asynchronous and if you take the signals from any one of them not pay attention to, to the other two I think you could get caught flat-footed and put your money in a place where you're gonna regret two, uh, two or three months down the road Greg always appreciate your time an original perspective given what everyone else is saying right now is also also always welcome Greg Staples there of DWS group Lisa got a long list of people who say we've seen the harder year on a 10-year and a very very short list of people, including Greg Staples, that say that it's not the case. And we saw uh, Steve Major over at HSBC change his view, and albeit he doesn't necessarily think that yields are going much higher, however, that to me was significant. That even bond bulls seem now uh, a case for yields to go higher than they previously did based on what they're hearing out of central banks. And honestly, how could they not be swayed to by the energy picture and some of the fiscal stimulus coming out of Europe? Well, it's the contagion out of Europe. 
that we've got to be focused on. We've seen yields absolutely surge. They're coming in today, and we'll see how that develops in the coming days and weeks. But, Lisa, that's been a story over the last couple of months there. Especially because we're talking about a 75 basis point rate hike tomorrow for the ECB. But you're also talking about fiscal policy, and this is the game changer, in my opinion. Fiscal policy, borrowing more to plug an undetermined gap for an indetermined amount of time. Kind of concerning when it Uncapped comes to Uncapped liability yeah, exactly. in a moment like this one of rising rates and QT. That's a radically different backdrop. Let's be very, very clear about all of that. And can I just say, I'm still sitting here shocked, surprised, Kaylee, that we're actually going to get potentially a 75 basis point move from the ECB tomorrow. I don't think that should be lost on anyone. This is a big deal. A it, month or so ago, I, I wasn't there. I don't think anyone was. Yeah, it, it definitely is a big deal. My question, John, is what impact ultimately will it have? When you have inflation that is being driven by an energy crisis that is no means looking like it's going to be resolved quickly, and a euro that is weak, not just because the euro is weak, but because the dollar is strong, how much does even a 75 basis point rate hike from the ECB make a difference in either of those equations? And do those hikes just make this currency weaker because it just smacks around growth even more? Complex stuff. Futures down about two tenths of one percent. Yields down about a basis point on a ten year, three thirty three forty one. This equity market turning around just a little bit in the last twenty minutes or so. We're down a quarter of one percent on the Nasdaq. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The UK's new Prime Minister Liz Truss will outline her energy plan before Parliament on Thursday. Today, she discussed a few ideas. Truss says she will build more nuclear power and open up the North Sea, a huge source of oil for the UK. She also addressed the idea of windfall tax on energy companies. I am against a windfall tax. I believe it is the wrong thing to be to be putting companies off investing in the United Kingdom just when we need to be growing the economy. Trust said the UK can tax its way to growth. Russia's President Vladimir Putin blames Western nations for the shutdown of Nord Stream natural gas pipeline. Putin told a forum in Vladivostok that gas flows to Europe could resume as soon as sanctions are lifted and Russia can get the pipeline's turbines serviced. He said, quote, give us turbines and we'll turn on Nord Stream tomorrow. Bloomberg's learned former Trump White House strategist Steve Bannon will surrender on Thursday to face criminal charges in New York. Last year, Manhattan prosecutors were investigating whether Bannon defrauded investors in the We Built the Wall project. Donald Trump pardoned Bannon after he was charged with federal fraud charges in the alleged scheme, but that pardon doesn't cover state charges. And reality TV star and entrepreneur Kim Kardashian has a new business venture. She and former partner at Carlyle Group, Jay Sammons, are launching a private equity firm. According to the Wall Street Journal, it will focus on consumer and business and media business. The apparel business Kardashian started in 2019, Skims, has been valued at $3.2 billion. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We've moved from a world where in the last two, three months, we've been worried about a U.S.-led global recession to now one where the combination of European problems with energy and China weakening is now the more significant uh, problem. Bruce Kasman at J.P. Morgan did not sound constructive on the global economy, Lisa, whatsoever yesterday, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, and you tried to start trouble by recommending no, that didn't. he and Marco uh, no, Kalanovic no, have just lunch. Wondered, and, I just know, wondered whether they'd had a conversation, conversation. Kaylee, about... Conversation. How bearish the one was on the economy and how bullish the other is on the equity market. They don't necessarily have to be the same thing as we know. The economy is not the stock market, Kelly. You know that too. Yeah, it's proved it time and time again. But I wonder if those two things are going to come You're more in this, line Kaylee. eventually. I wasn't suggesting they go for lunch. They can do what they want. Futures down a tenth of one percent. It's a free world, Bram. Oh, Dinner, yeah. drinks. Yeah, the peace, Nasdaq coffee. down a little more than a tenth of one percent. Marco's welcome anytime. Yields down a basis point. Never comes on. 333.21 <laughs> on a 10 year. On a 10 year right now, 333.
There we go. Coming back by a couple of basis points on a 10-year yield. Critty Gupta with us with a chart of the day. Morning, Critty. Well, good morning, John. The story of the day has to be that currency strength you're seeing in the dollar. But on the flip side, you're also seeing that fixing on the Chinese you want. And that's crucial as we talk about this race for a stronger currency between really the two largest economies in the world, which kind of rings a, a familiar bell, one of the trade war, perhaps. So for my chart of the day, for our radio audience here, we're looking at a histogram of Chinese exports to the United States. It is shrinking for the first time in two years. The last time we were in negative territory, it was 20, well, early 2020, mostly 2019. That was a trade war time. Tariffs really hurting that prospect. But keep in mind, this is priced in dollars now. So if you actually were to convert this, for example, into the renminbi, into the Chinese yuan, pick your, pick your phrasing, that would actually be a positive number, which once again really speaks to the currency strength you are starting to see affect the trade picture. What happens when you start to see a uh, those exports decline even further on a year-over-year -year basis, and that actually exacerbate the supply chain issues into the currency issues you're already seeing, John. That's going to be the question. Critty, thank you. On top of the FX story there, Critty Gupta, it's been fascinating to go over the cross currents in this FX market. Dollar CNH this morning, dollar China, 699.20. Getting closer and closer to that seven handle. Joining us now, a man who knows more than something about China, Tom Orlick, the chief economist for Bloomberg Economics. Tom, I want to start here. A lot of people approach the Chinese economy as a situation that they control, that they can just flick a switch, COVID on, lockdown on, lockdown off, do all of that, we're okay, we struggle, we're okay, we struggle. But ultimately, it's up to them. How much are some of the forces that have been unleashed in the Chinese economy this year, how much of it is out of their control? So I think what we're seeing right now, Jonathan, is the limits of China's state control. We're seeing that in COVID zero, where the new, more infectious variants of the virus are slipping through China's grip, forcing them to lock down entire cities to maintain their COVID zero strategy. And we're seeing it in real estate as well, where yes, China's policymakers retain tools to offset or prevent the worst outcome of a crash and financial crisis, but certainly they don't have the policy space or the tools they need to prevent a crunching correction in real estate construction, and all of that means all that means for their growth. And right now, we're also seeing exports fall more than people had expected. We got data overnight highlighting this, showing how some of the factory shutdowns are affecting the international business. What's the real pain on the ground? What's your latest assessment in terms of what we can expect for GDP for China this year? So, of course, what you really need as a Chinese leadership facing a severe drag on growth from COVID zero lockdowns and from a shrinking real estate sector is buoyant exports, right? This is a moment where China really wants to see those export numbers surging with consumers in the US and Europe offsetting some of that weakness at home. And as you just said, Lisa, that's just not what's happening. If you pull the pieces together, COVID lockdowns, real estate contraction, add weakness in exports to the mix, it's difficult to be optimistic about China's immediate growth prospects. The government said they wanted 5.5% growth this year. They're certainly not gonna get that. We think the outcome is gonna be somewhere in the three to 4% range. Tom, the other aspect of the uh, export data was the increasingly tight relationship with Russia. The fact that the exports to Russia increased and that the exports of refined oil increased, which raises a sus uh, suspicions that they are importing Russian oil, refining it, and then selling it back to Europe. How close is this relationship? Are we getting a sense of that? So let's not forget that at the start of this year, before Russia invaded Ukraine, um, Putin traveled to Beijing and stood next to Xi, and the two of them declared a deep strategic partnership between the two countries. So the relationship is there. Um, now, China hasn't explicitly lined up on Russia's side. They haven't said they export, they, they support the brutal invasion of Ukraine. Um, but neither have they lined up with Europe and the United States and supported those sanctions. And the export data you just mentioned showing increasing trade between the two countries, well, I think we can all draw the interpretation from that.
Tom, we were speaking with Richard Haas of the Council of Foreign Relations earlier on in the show about the risk now for American and multinational companies of doing business in China. John raised the point of we used to talk about the threat of doing business in Russia, and we have seen the exodus of companies from that market. If something simple, similar were to happen in China because it becomes just too contentious and difficult to conduct business there, what impact would that ultimately have on the Chinese economy? So I think there's a big difference between Russia and China that we need to keep in mind. Um, if American businesses stop doing business in Russia, that's a little bit of a blow to their current revenue and future growth prospects. If they stop doing business in China, well, China's the second biggest economy in the world, and in a decade's time, it could well be the biggest economy in the world. So pulling out of China is a big decision, potentially a big blow to revenue and future growth prospects. It's not a decision which companies are going to take lightly. That said, COVID lockdowns are taking a toll. Um, the growing hostility between China and the United States, the threat of sanctions, the threat of tariffs are taking a toll. And I think all of these things are forcing a reconsideration of U.S. and European business strategies when they think about how much business they want to be doing there. Tom, I remember when your book came out, The Bubble That Never Pops, and we had a conversation at the time about the title. Have you reconsidered that title just yet, Tom? I haven't reconsidered it, Jonathan. Um, not only have I not reconsidered it, I've just published the second edition. <laughs> um, so... Um, I don't know. I'm hoping I'm not going to have to make a call to Oxford University Press to, uh, to ask for a new title. Um, my view um, is that there are serious stresses on China's economy right now. COVID zero, the real estate slowdown. At the same time, China's policymakers have levers to manage those stresses. China's banks are very well funded, very well capitalized, which means they've got a cushion to absorb the inevitable increase in non-performing loans that's going to come as the property sector contracts. The bubble isn't bursting, but I'll concede the air is coming out of it at an accelerating pace. There we go. Tom, just brilliant to catch up with you, sir. And we're lucky to have you lead that team. Tom Arlick there of Bloomberg Economics. Equity futures right now, unchanged on the S&P, basically unchanged on the Nasdaq. With Lisa Bramitz and Kelly Lines, I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg. looking at a very precarious global situation, even more precarious than we're in now, the Fed may have to do something. It was fairly obvious coming into the year that the Fed would tighten. I think central banks are starting to understand that. They're not there yet. Panic is one of the biggest risks to investors right now. This is a market which is talking itself into a funk. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Dollar dominance, the big story this morning, live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Together with Kenny Lines, TK is going to be back tomorrow, I'm told. Futures down a tenth of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, down about a tenth of 1% also. This time tomorrow, Bramo will have a rate hike potentially from an ECB, somewhere between 50 and 75, and will be staring down the barrel of a news conference with President Lagarde. Yeah, and not only with a President Lagarde, but also, as you've pointed out, at the same time, we're going to hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell. What will Lagarde say? I think that she's actually got the much tougher job and she's got the much more uh, pressing speech to give how far they're willing to go and whether they're really just adjusting monetary policy in tandem with gasoline prices and natural gas prices. I mean, is that basically what's going on? Nat gas determining monetary policy. Basically, that's the issue in Europe right now. And we've said this repeatedly. If you can tell me what's going to happen with gas next year, what the price of it will be, I've got a better idea of what monetary policy will look like. Without yeah. the one, I'm not sure what the other is. Right, but then is this really effective? And this goes to the question that we've been asking all morning, and Kaylee too, about what the effect will be on the euro. In other words, if they raise rates by 75 basis points and they're managing to gas prices, is that going to support the euro or undermine it in terms of what the power and potency is of supporting the economy going forward? Ursula von der Leyen, the head of the European Commission, spoke earlier this morning. She said she wants to cut down Russia's energy revenues and stabilise its prices for Europeans.
Katie, I wonder whether you can actually achieve both at the same time. It's an excellent question. It seems like there is a lot of competing objectives for Europe and the UK, John, including the fact that they are talking about capping energy prices so that consumers can afford their bills, which in theory means the consumer can afford more energy spending, which doesn't do anything to affect demand, but they also want to bring demand down so that they can get through the winter. It's just it's just so difficult, John, and I honestly don't ultimately know if there is a good policy prescription for a crisis like this one, or are they just a series of less bad options? And that is the big, big problem. Lisa, when you're in a situation where you don't have the optimal policy decision to make, as Kelly pointed out, we said earlier in the program, it just comes down to what is the least worst decision that speaks to the bad spot, the tough spot Europe's in. The least worst decision politically or the least worst decision economically. Hmm. And I raise this point because Ed Morris had possibly the most interesting things to say that I've heard in a long time, saying, look, the market worked. You are seeing demand fall off in the U.S. for gasoline. And this is evidence that people are driving less, reducing consumption in the face of higher prices. Why won't Europe take the lesson? Why are they trying to plug the gap and finding themselves in this ever spiraling hole? Well, that's the big, big issue with the UK effort and we've yet to see the details and we're told that Liz Truss will unveil some of them tomorrow in an address to Parliament. If you're going to cap prices and take on unlimited liability, at the same time, Lisa, shouldn't you be doing something about curtailing demand given the limited supply, the limited supply backdrop you're likely to see through the next several months. Well, and then what, what do we call a market, right? I mean, how many aspects can you really control at one time? Or what are you controlling for? Christian Saving of, of Deutsche Bank coming out and saying, uh, and then uh, and a recession in Germany is inevitable at this point. So who's going to take the pain? How much can it be taken? And what can the government do to offset it, given these constraints that are market-driven and just supply and demand dynamics? And no one's pretending. You just mentioned the Deutsche Bank CEO. Kaylee, you've got the Deutsche Bank CEO basically saying, let's not pretend, yeah. recession's coming. It's not a question of if, it's a question of how deep it will be for the Europeans. Yeah, and not just in Europe and in Germany, in the UK as well. Andrew Bailey, when testifying before the Treasury, Secretary, uh, Treasury Select Committee earlier today, also said that the recession is a likely scenario at the same time that Hugh Pill said 22% inflation is plausible. It just speaks to the very, very difficult picture across the Atlantic right now. The dollar's the winner here. Dollar yen, absolutely flying cable. Look at this, 114.23, negative eight tenths of 1%. A whip through the price action, futures look like this, negative a tenth of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100, down a tenth of 1%. A little bit earlier this morning, a few times, Brammer went through the Fed speak. Look out for Brainerd the vice chair of the Fed. We're going to hear her on the economy, not financial regulation, not crypto on the economy a little bit later. Look out for that. Yields lower two basis points on a 10-year, 333 on a 10-year. Lisa, when's that address from the vice chair? 12.30 or 12.35, I actually read, p.m. Okay. Eastern. Looking forward to that. I think that's going to be an important one. Here's a quote from Lee Farage of State Street. A combination of the huge expansion in the government deficit and perhaps the pricing out of some rate hikes is hardly a positive sterling backdrop. I expect sterling to hit 110 this year. Lee Farage joins us right now. Lee, we're at 114.25 right now. <laughs> Might test that by the end of the week. What's going on? Yeah, I... You know, everything you've just been talking about, it's really hard to make a bullish case for sterling right now. You, you can argue it's undervalued, yes. You can argue that, that, that it's a crowded position being short sterling, yes. That's been true for months. And we're still, you know, we're down at 114 now. Yeah, 110 is my next target. My first target is 115. We hit that. No reason to change the view that the, the trend is downwards. So, yeah, 110. I mean, with the, as you say, with, with, with the mess with the energy prices, the economy there is going into recession. The Bank of England have told us that. They told us that a few weeks ago. Um, and, yeah, we're yet to see the, the, the package from, from new Prime Minister Trust tomorrow. But it's going to expand the deficit, and it's going to be huge. I mean, if you cap it for everyone, projections are £170 billion. Pounds. Well, the whole deficit in 2019 was £50 billion. So, well, yeah, you're blowing up the deficit. When do you get concerned about capital outflows, about a lack of trust from foreign investors that are being called upon to fund this effort? I mean, you look at the price action over the last month in guilds, and you could argue that, that, that maybe we're there. We went from around 160, 170 in 10-year yields to over 3%. So, you know, we didn't see moves like that anywhere else to, to that extent. So you could argue that's maybe already happening. And, yeah, it's just, you know, you, you add... 170 billion onto the deficit. Now we're going to see how she's going to fund it, um, but it's hard to imagine you're going to be able to fund it fully, um, and that's got to yeah increase that that idea of a maybe capital flight. And don't forget, 
you've got a significant current account deficit in the UK as well. You can have twin deficits both over 10% of GDP. So, you know, that's not a developed market sort of scenario that we're used to. Yeah, and of course, Liz Truss in PMQs today talking about how she does not want to have a windfall tax on excess profits for oil profits for oil and gas companies. So again, it raises the question of how this is going to be paid for. If we can come back to how this reads through into foreign exchange, Lee, talking about the weak pound, as you described, the other side of that is a stronger dollar. Is there any barrier to that dollar strength right now, or does this just keep on going? Arguably, the, the two biggest barriers are the, the ones I mentioned with Sterling. It's valuation and it's, it's crowded positioning. Um, but that has been the case for a while for the dollar against the euro, the dollar against the yen, the dollar against Sterling. It's, it's been that way for a while. The fact is, when you look at it, the Fed have, have laid out their course. They're going to be hawkish. They're going to continue doing what they're doing. But the U.S. economy is in a much better spot. No, it's not a great spot. But it's in a much better spot than, than Europe, for an example. The yen is a little bit different. I think the yen move is, 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 of all of them, is the one that's the most overdone. But certainly when you look at Europe, yeah, the U.S. is in a much better spot. As I say, not great on its own in absolute terms. But in relative terms, yes, it, it, it's hard to make a case for Europe over the U.S. in any form right now. And that, that's what we're seeing. And that's why the euro's down here. That's why sterling's down here. And that's why, for now, these moves are going to continue. There's no... There's no reason for them to stop right now. Lee, is a relative case to buy the US over Europe a reason to buy it? Sorry, Jonathan, I missed that. The, the is a relative case, case of... that the US is better than Europe, is that a reason enough to buy the US equity market right now? Well, it is, you know, if you've got capital flight from Europe, if you don't want your money to be in Europe, if you're a US investor that doesn't want it there, you want to bring it home. Maybe you're a European investor. Do you want to invest domestically? in a market that's struggling and in a currency that's declining, or do you increase your allocation overseas? So, you know, as long as those flows keep going, then, yeah, it's, it's a reason for, for the dollar to go up against the euro and sterling. Well, Lee, that's the question, the isn't it? flows win. It's if you come to the United States, where do you go? All well and good just saying dollar-denominated assets. What assets, Lee, specifically? Jonathan, you can go into cash. Right, you can go into cash in the US. You're getting zero in the Eurozone right now. Yeah, you're going to get 50 basis points or 75 basis points. But what the dollar gives you right now, if you're a European investor, you get a yield and you get a safe haven. So you're buying a tail risk hedge for your overall portfolio because you're buying a safe haven asset that also gives you yield. Why wouldn't you do that? Elite, do you think that's what's happening right now? Is that the general trend of things that you think will continue into year end? I do. I mean, I think the first half of this year when we saw dollar strength, particularly when the, the invasion happened, that was safe haven buying. We know the dollar, when it comes to, to, to global turmoil, is the safe haven. But then when we got that rally in equities, you know, that, that sort of June-July rally, the dollar still went up, and that's when it became more of a carry trade, I think. And so, you know, investors aren't massively positioned underweight risk in their overall portfolios. But they, given that, they're still nervous. They want a tail risk hedge. The dollar gives you that. And it gives you carry. And the Japanese it's ideal yen in this world. Does not at all. The yen is just not yen. working on that front. Well, and it hasn't worked as a safe haven all year and it doesn't give you any yield. So why would you choose the, the yen over the dollar? Lee Farage of State Street. Lee, just brilliant. I say this as we get closer and closer to 145 on dollar yen, 144.94. Bramo, high the session was moments ago was 144.99, 144.99, the harder session. Yeah, and Lee was saying that perhaps it's the most overdone, but what's going to break it other than a weaker dollar, and what's going to drive the dollar weaker, given that everybody is saying even being in cash in the U.S. is the better trade than anywhere else, and possibly even equities? I mean, your question's a good one about what do you buy? Is it a reason enough to buy? And a lot of people, certainly with the dollar, seem to be saying yes. The dollar absolutely ripping again this morning. That's a 1.5% move on dollar yen. Coming up, Walter Pysik of Light Shed Partners. Kaylee, what are we going to talk to him about? Oh, the new iPhone, John. For the record, <sighs> slow down. More than 400 people have voted uh, in my Twitter uh, poll. What have we got? 75% say yes. Their old iPhone slows down when the new one comes out. There you go, Bramo. What do you make it. of that? I think. What do you make that, of that? That's well, a real. Everybody that's wants a, that's to a believe real, conspiracies. That's a, who said anything about a conspiracy? It's a it's poll. Trying to get the people you have to buy spoken. The new one. We're just asking people how to feel. I feel good. And they, they say they feel like it <laughs> slows Wednesday. down. They feel like it slows down. <laughs> Walter's going to have thoughts next from New York. This is Bloomberg.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. There's a report that one of the documents sees that Donald Trump's Florida residence describes a foreign government's nuclear weapons capabilities. That's according to the Washington Post. The newspaper also says that some of the documents discuss closely guarded, top secret U.S. operations. Russia's Vladimir Putin and China's Xi Jinping will meet next week in Uzbekistan. That's according to a Russian official. Now, the trip would be Xi's first foreign journey in two and a half years. Putin and Xi met in Beijing in February, weeks before the Kremlin sent troops into Ukraine. They signed an agreement saying that relations between the two countries would have no limits. Tomorrow, new British Prime Minister Liz Truss will set out her plan to help households and businesses to deal with the soaring energy bills. Truss spoke today during her first Prime Minister's question session in Parliament. In our energy plan that will help support businesses and people with the immediate price crisis, as well as making sure there are long-term supplies available, will help businesses as well as helping individual households. Trust also ruled out a windfall profits tax on energy companies. The airline's main trade lobby says global passenger demand remains strong. According to the IATA, traffic was up 59% in July from the previous year. It's now at about 75% of pre-crisis levels. The IATA also said that pilot shortages are really only an issue in the U.S. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Inflation fever, I think, is is beginning to is beginning to break. You've got corporates, consumers that, uh, for now, are remaining remarkably resilient. It won't last forever, but um, it's 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 the fact of the matter today. Uh, the U.S. economy is actually reaccelerating right now. Did you see the ISM yesterday? Ben Laidler of eToro there. The ISM for services. Bramo, everyone just said, yeah, ignore that S and P Global PMI. The ISM for services, absolutely flying. People actually breaking down why and showing a very direct correlation to lower bills at the gas pump to higher bills elsewhere as people funneled it into certainly traveling over the weekend. Unreal. Else. Can yeah. we have a conversation with Walter Pisic now about the iPhone? Can we do that? Lisa? How, how slow is it? Let's talk about that. Walter Pisic joins us right now, partner at Lightshed Partners. <laughs> well, I'll leave the big question until the end of the conversation. People can't wait for that. <laughs> Let's talk can't about wait. the new iPhone. <laughs> What's the price point of this one going to be? I think the same. I don't think there's going to be a price increase or a price decrease uh, this time around. I mean, they're, they're talking about new processors. They, maybe the camera notch is going to change a little bit on you. And the big thing is because of the name of the event and what Elon Musk uh, did a week or so ago is perhaps adding some space connectivity to this device. What does that actually mean, Walter? It just means that when you're off the grid in Utah doing your hikes, walkabouts or whatever, that, you know, if, if you happen um, to need to send an emergency text message through, uh, that maybe there'd be a satellite constellation that would help you to make that connection, which is very different than I think what Elon was, was trying to propose or the Elon and T-Mobile were supposed to do or attempting to do next year. There are very high expectations for this sales cycle since the last one was disappointing. And there weren't that many advancements in the previous edition, which is one reason why people said that this could be the problem. But you see one chip maker after another saying that demand for phones, the smartphones, demand for uh, hardware just in general has been going down significantly. What do you need to see to remain constructive on Apple's outlook? I don't think actually this print means anything, right? Because we're just now really starting to feel the implications of inflation. I mean, just look at your credit card bill and see how prices have gone up across the board on things. So I think I'm not sure that someone, the number of phones, um, you know, that's going to be reported this quarter matter. And this product announcement, I'm not sure is going to matter. The, the real question is going to be, if it's the same price, even if it's 100 or $200 cheaper, doubtful, not going to happen. You know, are consumers going to be willing to spend that type of money um, going into this December and into the March quarter? And that's that that's going to be a big question for all of us to figure out. Well, and it's not just a question if, if they want to spend on a new iPhone. What about some of the other products, a new watch, new AirPods? What is the incentive to upgrade those in an inflationary environment where everything costs more? That's a very valid point. The appetite could be um, waning. On the flip side, you know, the Apple ecosystem is super strong. I mean, this the watch, the, the AirPods that, you know, when these AirPods originally came out, I think many people thought they looked ridiculous. Now everyone has them. The watches, you, you see the stats that Apple gives every quarter in terms of number of new 
customers that have never had a watch or never in the Apple ecosystem before. So I think mm -hmm. that Apple ecosystem is so strong that they give you a bigger watch. Maybe they add some satellite connectivity. We'll get to this later in the interview. Maybe your battery's getting a little weak. There's plenty of reasons, <laughs> I think, to, to, to upgrade. All right, I don't want to steal John's thunder with that question, so I'll ask something else. Everything we just talked about is on the demand side. Are we no longer worried about Apple's issues on the supply side? Are they past that? I don't see how you can get past supply side concerns. I mean, yes, I think supply chain in general is okay, but there's still like geopolitical issues that you have to address that's out there that if you want to move manufacturing from one location to another location where you're moving it from, you know, there's a country there where, you know, they might not want that to happen. And, and you know, there are some things that they can do in terms of limiting phone purchases and, and uh, uh, items like that, that that can impact it. So I don't think it's you're never fully out of the woods. Remember, Tim Cook, you know, his specialty is supply chain. Right. I mean, I think we all forget about that, given the incredible value that he's built into this company. But he is a supply chain specialist. So, yes, there's always going to be challenges. You can't ignore that. But, you know, hopefully Tim's got got a, a good handle on that. What if I say, do you think this is coming to a head, though? We caught up with Richard Haas of the Council of Foreign Relations a little bit later this morning. And clearly, Apple is the perfect example of a company stuck between China and the United States. Do they have to make a decision at some point? I mean, I don't know if you, hopefully you don't have to make a decision. You know, there's always noise to watch. You saw some U.S. politicians um, visiting Taiwan, and, and obviously that's going to create, I think, some additional friction between the U.S. Um, and a U.S.-based company like Apple and China. So uh, hopefully this doesn't lead to anything for all of our sakes. But, um, you know, it's, again, something you, you have to keep watching the tea leaves to see, you know, which way this is going to bend. But does it mean it's also going to be more expensive? There has to be some built-in redundancy in their production cycle to offset the risk of closures of uh, things like what we've seen in some of the main production areas in China. Unfortunately, you can't just snap your fingers and create redundancy. It takes time to bring up plants in different countries and bring up that capacity. And there's just certain, um, as we've seen, you know, in various forms of the supply chain, where we learn that there's certain products that are made in countries that. You know, if, if the country is, for whatever reason, can't ship that stuff out, it impacts us globally. So I, I think it's, again, this is Tim Cook's specialty on the supply chain side, but it's still just not easy to just snap your fingers and switch supply from one location to another. Well, I don't set the agenda here, so I want to give you multiple choices to prove that I don't. We can talk about Chelsea being above Liverpool in the league, and yet they sacked their manager and you've still got yours. Or we can talk about iPhones magically slowing down when new ones come out. I think it was that handshake with Conti that was the, that was the final straw. That was that was the final. That was well, the loss. Yeah, the loss yesterday ever. may have had an impact. Hopefully, hopefully discuss, Liverpool can do better. I've been dying to discuss that all morning. It's just Bramo hates <laughs> football. So I don't I hate football. I'm just into rounders. Rounders. I don't think Walter knows what rounders is. <laughs> I didn't either until you explained it to well, me this morning. It's basically a short bat instead of like a long bat. It's basically. I think it's what baseball was based on. <laughs> Stop. Started as You're so mean. What a price it. Thank you. Of light shed fun. Nice. Well let, him, let him get out of it. I gave him a choice. I don't want people at Apple thinking this is an agenda I've got. I'm just asking questions this morning about phones magically slowing down when new phones come out. Magically. It might be magically. It might just be okay. you know, coincidental. It might there... be my experience. So someone pointed out that when you get used to something much, much quicker, it starts to feel like the old one was much slower. Okay, but do you actually borrow your friend's phones to no. see how fast they are? No, I just noticed the thing really slows down. <laughs> it just seems old Something and fragile. Something about the updates to iOS, you do it, and then all of a sudden it just feels like, you know, sluggish. Well, all the updates are frustrating, right? That is a difficulty. The charging is also an issue. Ah. I mean, that was something Walter was having issues with, I know, and I, I, I also sometimes... What are you upset with about the charging? That it, after a while, it's hard to charge the phone, that some chargers yeah. don't work, and it becomes really challenging just to get it to Just out connect. of interest, does that usually happen when a new one comes out? <laughs> it usually <laughs> happens, but I'm when not... When a new one comes out? Fully no. slept in and... You know, haven't had vacation in a while. No, I mean, Not like, like around September time. <laughs> September time, right, when they have Every a new year. edition. Just an example. Something okay. like that. All right. Kelly Lines, Lisa Brown, and Jonathan <laughs> okay, Farrell. Let's move on. We've got a poll out there, so go on to Kelly Lines' Twitter and 
join in if you wish. Uh, futures down a third of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about a quarter of 1%. What a great time to have this conversation. George Saravelos, the global head of FX research at Deutsche Bank, with the euro breaking down to about 98.90 on euro dollar. And this story right here, sterling, sterling down to 114.31. That currency pair is negative, about eight tenths of 1%. Dollar CNH. 698.91 and a session high of 699.71 and dollar yen dollar yen having a look at 145 all morning there's a lot to discuss next from new york this is bloomberg here's some feedback on the apple debate so would your tape cassette Walkman? Why even buy new things? <laughs> it's a poor framing of the question. OK, this ain't Michael. That was the tweet from this ain't Michael, which I assume is Michael. From New York <laughs> City this morning. <laughs> Twitter's a special place. Good morning to you. <laughs> Kenny Lines, Lisa Bramerton, Jonathan Farrow. TK's going to be back with us tomorrow. Futures down about a third of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're down about two tenths of 1%. Main story this morning, it's been the story of much of the year so far. It's just dollar dominance. Euro dollar 98.95. Negative a tenth of 1% on that currency pair. Cable right now, 114.35, down three quarters of 1%. Dollar China, 698.66. Very, came very, very close to a seven handle at 699 a little bit earlier this morning. And dollar yen just flirting with 145 over the last 24 hours. Right now, 144.63. Back it away, harder session. 144.99. I think you get the picture. It's all about dollar strength. And joining us now is George Saravelos, global head of FX research over at Deutsche Bank. George. Let's start with that dollar strength. What is the number one dominant driver of what's taking place, not just in Europe, but across Asia too? Hi, John. So it's, it's clearly historic times in FX. Uh, and I'd say what's going on is that valua valuation anchors are being lost. So, you know, you take Europe, for example, producer prices are now up 40% over the last 18 months. Um, what does that mean for purchasing power parity, for, for how much co competitiveness has been impacted. Um, the market doesn't really know and is, is, is trying to grapple with, with that question. Um, you mentioned the yen. Um, the BOJ has been doing the Fed equivalent of a trillion of QE um, in recent months. It's now starting to pick up again. It, it's basically following a policy of, of neglect for the yen. It hasn't spoken about the yen um, for, for, the last, for the last two months. Uh, and, and I think if you add all these things together, um, the dollar is ending up as the safe haven of choice um, by default because there's all these issues in the rest of the world. And, and I think the, the critical point is it becomes very difficult to understand and calibrate fair value given these huge moves we're seeing in energy prices, um, it changes in policy, uh, for example, out of Japan. And obviously we've got the COVID situation in China. When do we reach a breaking point, George? And I speak as we start reaching levels that perhaps were last seen or the pace of which were last seen uh, in 2020, which prompted Federal Reserve intervention. Yeah, so in some currencies we were even exceeding those and going back to, to the 1980s, uh, the, the huge 1984 overshoot um, back then um, kept going. It, it actually, currencies back then decoupled from rates even as Volcker stopped. Um, the dollar kept going, even as the U.S. external accounts turned. And it became a bit of a self-fulfilling um, situation where, where, again, valuation anchors were lost. And what it took to turn things um, was coordinated intervention. And you had the Fed starting to sound a bit more jittery and then obviously the, the Plaza Accord. Um, I still think we're far away from that, not least because dollar strength at the moment is helping the U.S. inflation story. Uh, and it is very likely um, that um, core goods inflation in the U.S. I think will move sharply lower. Um, so one thing that will be able to shift things is, is if we get a Fed pivot um, that's clearly too early. Um, that's on the U.S. side, uh, just an easing of these stagflation fears. Uh, but then, of course, uh, we've got the issues outside of the U.S., both in Europe um, and Asia. It, it's very difficult over the next few months to see these fundamental issues, this uncertainty, um, go away. Uh, and, and as such, uh, I think it's very difficult to, to call for a big turn in the dollar um, as things stand. Well, given that, George, what's the going to stop the euro from going to 90, uh, 0 0.9 uh, on the dollar? What's going to stop the yen from going to 150, as we were talking about yesterday? What's going to be the pivot point for some of these currencies, as there is not necessarily uh, some sort of circuit breaker? 
So I think there's two things that can prevent um, extreme moves. I, obviously, in Japan, you are seeing extreme moves because the Bank of Japan via its policy is actually encouraging yen weakness. But speaking of Europe, there's two things. Um, number one, the ECB becoming more aggressive, becoming more assertive, talking about the currency. Um, and I don't agree with this argument that if the ECB hikes more, it's going to be negative for the currency because it hurts growth. You are actually seeing the euro hold up much better than what one would have expected, given that we've now started okay. to price 75 pips, for example. So I think the ECB is one and the right fiscal policy response as far as the energy situation goes. And that's where the differences between the UK and the euro area become a bit more interesting, for example. OK, so George, is essentially what you're saying. The ECB can support the euro by hiking, but that is not necessarily the case for the Bank of England. So the ECB central banks can slow down the moves, but it's not interest rate differentials are not the dominant drivers. And, and we're seeing that the ECB is helping slow down the euro depreciation. But I think to see a big shift, you need a resolution um, on the energy situation. Now, if you, if you go over to the UK, um, I'm still surprised by the lack of urgency from the Bank of England in terms of this communication of how much more um, they can do. Um, you've got an inflation picture that's pretty much um, the worst in the developed world. Um, we are very likely to get very, very sizable fiscal announcements in place that may help inflation in the near term, but they're also going to be highly stimulative. They're not going to allow for any correction on, on the demand side. So I worry in the UK policy alignment between the fiscal authorities and monetary authorities is, is not there. Um, and this in itself um, may be quite harmful for the currency. How harmful? I mean, what probability would you put around cable at parity. So um, we, we wrote a report where we're looking at all these drivers. We're looking at the balance of payments dynamics in, in the UK. And what stands out really is versus 10 years ago, the position is much more vulnerable. You've got a negative net international investment position. You've got a very large current account deficit. You've got real rates that are still very low. Um, and for me, over the next two or three weeks, it's all about policy credibility and alignment. Um, and if we go down the route, of a very large unfunded, untargeted uh, fiscal stimulus and the Bank of England, for example, disappointing market expectations and not hiking by 75 basis points, not showing a greater sense of urgency. I do worry the funding of this very large deficit um, the UK has with the rest of the world um, can be challenged and you can see um, very extreme levels um, for the pound as you have in the past when the UK has struggled to attract foreign financing. In the Euro region in particular, you were talking about how the appropriate fiscal policy could support the Euro. And I want to go back to that. What does the appropriate policy look like, given the fact that a lot of households are really struggling? This is not like $5 a barrel of gasoline or $5 a gallon gasoline in the United States. This is way more extreme, way more punitive for households over in Europe. Can they not offset it at all? And if they do, is there something that's prudent that could still support the Euro? It's a really important question, and what I would say is it's a fine um, needle to thread, so to speak, in that, yes, you have to target policy in terms of preventing some of the pass-through, especially for the lower-income households, but at the same time, you have to allow price signals to work um, and demand to drop. And uh, I, I have to say, I think the European policy response over the last few months has been quite impressive in that front, in that you have seen the situation is very extreme in terms of the price rises, but you are seeing demand management. Um, industrial demand in Germany for gas has dropped by 20%. At the same time, there is support for the low-income households. But fiscal policy is not blowing out um, in, in terms of being completely unfunded. Um, we've obviously got this very uh, significant energy summit um, happening on Friday. But I would say, ultimately, the policy response that helps is one that allows the market signals to work, but preventing some of the more extreme um, downside risks. And Europe is heading in that direction. Finally, George, if we could leave Europe and head back to Asia, because you've mentioned the Japanese yen a few times, flirting with 145 to the dollar this morning, the weakest level we have seen going back to August of 1998. And you've also alluded to the fact that the Bank of Japan is sticking with its motto. We're going to keep it easy. We're going to keep yield curve control. Is there a level on dollar yen that you think would represent a breaking point for Kuroda? I don't really think there is. Uh, I, I think from a policymaking and a macro perspective, what matters is the speed. Um, so if, if you get an extreme disorderly move, so to speak, then it becomes either easier to invoke uh, the G7 and G20 agreements on disorderly market moves. But the reality is, even though the yen move has been extremely large, 25% uh, this year, 
it's actually been fairly orderly and it's been aligned at the end of the day with what the BOJ has been doing, uh, with, which is easing policy. So I find it very difficult um, to see a situation where any sort of intervention will be credible from a market perspective. At the end of the day, what's needed is for the BOJ to pivot. Now, that may happen um, if Kuroda, for example, uh, when his term expires, you get a governor that's um, got a slightly different approach, obviously backed by the government. Um, but as things stand, I'm not sure intervention um, will, will be credible. And the bar for that to happen is, is very high uh, in the sense that the moves will need to be highly disorderly. And at the moment, they're big. Uh, but um, they're not especially volatile. They're highly intuitive. It makes perfect sense. And that's why I think we're all struggling with this idea that the BOJ has any grounds to complain right now, George. George, thank you for your time. And what a world you guys are in right now in foreign exchange. George Saravalos there of Deutsche Bank. Pramo, how can the BOJ or the Treasury in Japan ever complain about this? It's orderly. It's perfectly intuitive. It makes perfect sense. Everyone else is hiking and you're sitting there saying, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. So when does it become an economic problem where they're importing inflation to such a degree that they have to respond, right? I mean, can they basically say, okay, oh, well, well, I guess that we can just support this because we think that inflation is good. And if we've got 2% inflation, uh, this is perhaps not great. We still need to get the economy going faster. And we think this supports us. I mean, what's the breaking point for them on a fundamental point of view if they're not importing too much inflation? I'm not sure, but maybe the situation with the Fed starts to fade before and, yeah. and bails things out. Excuse my choice of words for the Japanese policymaker, Lisa. Maybe that's what comes first. Well, and that's what some people are thinking, that they will only pivot once that dollar starts coming off because it will be easier for them to do so. The moves in the market won't be so violent and they won't lose face. It's been a macro trade that hasn't worked, hasn't it? If I told you everything that was going to happen this year, you wanted that risk-off, safe haven trade in foreign exchange. Yen has not got it done. What's worked this year? I mean, honestly, everything has gotten flipped on its head multiple times. Remember a couple of months ago, people were saying duration, go into sure. long bonds. Well, <laughs> guess what? That hasn't been that great over the past couple of weeks. Whisper it, say it louder. Yeah. <laughs> US dollars worked out, US dollars worked out. Katie, where did that poll wrap up? Oh, it's ongoing, John, but we have more than 500 votes and still three quarters of people are saying their phone's slowing down. Oh, Blame the go. software update. Katie, can I consensus. say thank you on a serious note? Thank you for putting in the extra shift. We appreciate it. Just fantastic to have you with us on the program. Always, John. TK is going to be back with us tomorrow with Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Coming up as we count you down to the open, Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo, Gargi Chowdhury of BlackRock, Jay Pulaski of TPW Advisory on a big ECB decision and dollar dominance. That's coming up. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Russia's President Vladimir Putin blames Western nations for the shutdown of the Nord Stream natural gas pipeline. Putin told a forum in Vladivostok that gas flows to Europe could resume as soon as sanctions are lifted and Russia can get the pipeline's turbines serviced. He said, quote, give us turbines and we'll turn on Nord Stream tomorrow. U.S. officials say that Russia wants to buy millions of rockets and artillery shells from North Korea. It's the latest sign that Moscow is being pressured by international sanctions. There's no indication that any weapon sales have been completed. Last month, the CIA said Russia had approached Iran to buy armed drones. Bloomberg's learned that former White House strategist Steve Bannon will surrender Thursday to face criminal charges in New York. Last year, Manhattan prosecutors were investigating whether Bannon defrauded investors in the We Built the Wall project. Donald Trump pardoned Bannon after he was charged with federal fraud charges in the alleged scheme, but that pardon doesn't cover state charges. And California narrowly avoided blackouts for a second day in a row. For several hours late Tuesday, the state imposed its highest level of energy emergency. Consumers were urged to turn off lights and curb air conditioners. Triple-digit temperatures pushed demand for electricity to a record. Authorities are preparing for more pressure on the power system today. Global news, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Right now, the, the dollar strength is, is as much a good thing as it is a bad thing. Um, but fast forward six, nine months, euro maybe at 90 cents, dollar yen at 150. Maybe the calculus changes and we start to talk about coordinated intervention. I, I don't think we can rule this out.
what is the breaking point for the dollar as the dollar hits the highest level on the broad weighted index uh, since 2002? Eric Nelson of uh, MacroStrategist at Wells Fargo Securities weighing in on just that. And one of the biggest factors in deciding the dollar's strength and just how far it can go and what central banks have to do to fight the inflationary impulse is very much the energy story, which has been a mystery. It has been incredibly difficult to get the story right. Bloomberg's Alex Steele has been surveying all of the chief executive officers of big energy companies at Barclays CEO Energy Power Conference in New York. She is joining us now with Ryan Lance, Conoco CEO. Alex, cannot wait to hear what you have to say. Lisa, thanks very much. I appreciate that. So Conoco stock is up about 100% uh, in the last year. Typically, as Conoco goes, the rest of the industry goes. They tend to lead the themes in the industry. So having this conversation with Ryan right now is particularly important in the midst of an energy and gas crisis over in Europe. Ryan, it's really good to see you in person. Thank you. Great to be here, Alex. Speaking of, you just returned to Europe. Uh, Ursula von der from Europe, Ursula von der Leyen said today talked about a solidarity contribution from fossil fuel companies in order to help pay for the energy crisis. What's your response? What are you thinking when it comes to Europe? Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's a whole different conversation going on in Europe today than it was one year ago. Certainly energy security has elevated its position, and certainly we're going through a transition. We have to do it more sustainably. And I think they're struggling with how to write the right policy to encourage early-time investment, yet figure out how they want to go through the transition. And some of what they're talking about with excess profits tax, it's going to have the unintended consequence of reducing supply long term. So I think they've really got to think through how they're going to manage their whole supply situation and what it means to eliminate, get, get off a Russian supply, both from the oil and the gas side. And it is a Gordian's knot. It is a really tough, tough thing that they're going through. But the solution is not to tax, more, tax what you want more of in the short term. Right. That's going to deter maybe where you then put your money. Uh, yeah, you're going to put your money into other places, and, and supply is going to go down while demand is still out there. So for you, you're an oil company. You're an ENP, but really you're like a mini major. I mean, <laughs> the kind of investments you've been making in LNG have yeah. been pretty tremendous, whether it comes out from Sempra, an equity stake here in the U.S., uh, your investment in Qatar, or you just had an announcement yesterday about Ajera starting up a U.S. hydrogen plant. And I say all this because what's your runway, what runway to profit from LNG right now? Well, we looked at, uh, so we stepped back, did a couple of transactions over the last couple of years, dramatically grew our U.S. lower 48 position through the contract acquisition and some shell acquisition. And when we did that, we knew that our gas production was going to be rising over, over time, over long term. And we're also very bullish on the LNG market. Gas has a transition fuel sitting in the energy transition. So that led our discussions to wanting to increase our position in Qatar, grow our position in Australia. And then ultimately we wanted an LNG position here in the U.S. so our gas doesn't get stranded and we can take advantage of some of the arbitrage we see going on long term because we see it as a very good long term position. That was what led us to this recent decision to partner with Sempra at Port Arthur and grow that. It's got some option value for their West Coast LNG position as well as grow grow further in the LNG side in, in the Gulf Coast. And then most recently you referred to the JERA. This is working with a customer that we've known for 45 years who is trying to transition and interested in hydrogen, both green and blue hydrogen. So it's a deal where we're going to look at together. We know how to inject CO2 back into the ground. We have the resource, the land position in the Gulf Coast to do that. We own the land. Mm -hmm. Working with them to try to understand is there a business that we can create there that can give us decent returns on our business and satisfy their long-term need on the transition. So what's next on Ryan's list? What other kind of partnerships? What other kind of opportunities? Well, I think we're, we're leaning in. I mean, we're investing uh, you know, more capital. We're growing the company. Uh, pretty pleased with where we've gotten in the portfolio today. So today we have 20 billion barrels of resource that has a cost of supply that averages less than $30 a barrel. So that creates the margin, creates the return that we need in our business. We're giving 30% of our cash or more back to our mm -hmm. shareholder every year. So we're keeping everybody satisfied and growing the company at the same time. But so I'm pretty constructive. LNG, but in terms of LNG specifically, and then we oh, get to oil in a second. Sorry. In LNG, are there any other kinds of deals, JVs, bolt-ons? Like, are there other stuff you can do? Yeah, there's certainly other stuff. Again, the separate deal came with some option value to grow on the west coast of, of Mexico. We'll take a look at that, grow additional trains at, at Port Arthur. Um, we're we're, exi we're uh, interested in growing more in Australia, and we think there's going to be future growth in Qatar as well. We're interested in playing in that, that space as well. At, at what point do you think that you'd um, siphon off more capex in the U.S. to get more gas out of the wells you have here versus, say, oil? Is there ever going to come a time where that happens? You know, it, it may be. I think what, what we're interested in is just stable programs going forward. We're pretty agnostic. Our cost of supply model that we use inside our company says we won't invest in anything over a $40 cost supply. And we really don't care if it's gas or oil. We're really trying to drive the 
kind of margins that we see in the business and the returns that we see, we're pretty agnostic. But we know that our gas position is going to grow as our oil position grows, and we don't want that to be dislocated from the actual markets and get the maximum margin we can out of that product. And obviously all of that is in support truly of being able to return cash to shareholders as well, which is the industry theme. You got to grow, you got to be in the right energy space, and you got to deliver uh, cash returns. H how do we know that all those cash returns that we're seeing are sustainable? Well, I think when you when you look at it, our commitment is to give 30 percent of our cash back to our shareholders right off the top. And that's, I think a, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. Okay. So I think what the, the underlying principle around that is, is that you better have a portfolio that you can grow and develop your company on, on less than 70 percent of your cash flow. And you need to do that at a mid-cycle price. You can't do that. It's easy to do at $100, $120 sure. oil. The question is, what can you do at $50 and $60 and uh, order a mid-cycle price going long-term in this business? So that's our commitment. We've worked really hard over the last number of years to get our portfolio in a place that where we can only invest 70% of our cash flow and we can grow the company on that. So we're taking care of our growth. We're taking care of our shareholder. We're keeping a balance sheet that's really strong because the volatility is going to be in this business. And you've got to have a strong balance sheet to manage it. Is there going to come a point where you think that companies are spending too much on distribution to shareholders and not enough investing? Well, I think people that have a free cash flow model that de sets their distribution have to be careful because that's, that could artificially suppress capital to where they're not growing their company and they're giving a bunch back to the shareholder. Mm -hmm. Our model is off our cash flow. So, it, you know, it's kind of indifferent to what the capital program is going to be. We have a commitment to what our cash flow is going to be in delivering 30 percent that back to the shareholder. I think some of the other companies have to be careful that, that formulaically give back a bunch of cash to shareholders that are based on a free cash flow model because they, their tendency won't let their capital rise you know, to, to really grow and develop mm -hmm. their companies. And along the same lines, do you think we get back to $50 oil? Do we get back to like $2 natural gas? I, well, I, don't, I don't think $2 natural gas is in our future. I think mid-cycle prices are much higher than that. Um, will we get back to 50 and 60? You know, there's times that we probably will see that. I don't mm -hmm. think we're going to see that in the short term, mm -hmm. in the near term, two, three, four years. I'm pretty constructive in the market. I just think the supply-demand fundamentals today are driving us to these kinds of prices. So um, that's the world we're going to be living in for the next few years. Do you see any sort of demand weakness from China, from Europe, like are the recessionary signals that are blinking for you? Yeah, certainly on the demand side, COVID coming back and, you know, impacting China, the recession, inflationary forces are impacting, suppressing some of the demand growth. But then you look on the supply side, supply's having a tough kind of keep up. OECD inventories are at their lowest level they've mm -hmm. been in five and five and ten years. So we've got to rebuild inventory. Inventory. We're putting a bunch of SPR barrels into the market today. That's limited in its duration, propping up the supply. What happens when that uh, those those barrels leave the market? So there's a lot of conflicting data out there, and it all says you know we're going to see these kind of elevated prices for a while. Um, to that point, uh, your cost inputs for next year. I know you guys are still working on your budgets and stuff for next year, but do you have an idea of how much higher costs are going to be next year versus this year? Mm -hmm. Well, I think globally we're seeing inflation rates that I would call in the 7 to 8 percent range okay. around the whole company. So you, all, you will see some reset of capital programs as, and, and operating programs as we go forward. Now, if you're a pure play in the Permian Basin, you're seeing much, much higher inflation rates, probably high teens kinds of inflation rates sitting you know, in the Permian Basin today. We see that in our business, and I think all of industry is seeing that as well. So, yeah, uh, the advantage we have is being a global diverse company. We can mute some of those higher higher inflation rates in some of our activity based on the global portfolio that we have today. Does that affect where you allocate capital then, based on those inflation rates? It does, but it's on the margin. It's okay. not, not a significant reallocation of capital. Our cost supply model would suggest we're going to the lowest cost supply we can, and inflation has an impact on that, but not a significant one. Ryan, it's always a pleasure. It's been a really Thank long time since I've seen you in person. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, Ryan good Lance, to see you. good to see you. Uh, the CEO of ConocoPhillips. Lisa, back to you. Alex, thank you so much. Fascinating time to be speaking with the energy executives as they face off with such an uncertain backdrop, not only when it comes to the supply demand backdrop, but also with respect to policy at a time when Europe and the U.S. are both trying to uh, keep things under control. That was uh, Ryan uh, Lance, the ConocoPhillips CEO. So I've got a question, Kate. I'm looking right now at oil prices at the lowest level since January, crude uh, on both Brent and WTI, and I am still finding the why a little bit difficult, right? And we were talking about this with Ed Morse earlier this morning. He was saying the why is less China than you might think. It is also Europe. It is also the U.S. How much is that really what we're seeing? 
Yeah. Is it a demand side problem now rather than a supply side one that the market was focused on previously as we talk about the growing risk of a global recession with the CEO of Deutsche Bank saying a recession is inevitable in Germany. Andrew Bailey of the Bank of England essentially saying it the same thing about the UK that it's the most likely scenario. So no longer does this just seem like a China centric problem. Global economies around the world are dealing with a slowdown, potentially a major one in growth and ultimately it tracks that that would bring oil demand down. And that seems to be what OPEC plus is reacting to as well. Indeed. And we're also looking at a stronger dollar, which possibly is helping yeah. things a little bit, too, in terms of bringing down prices. Very much a dollar story this morning as other markets are kind of range bound here. You're seeing a little bit of a retracement of some of the yield pop that we saw yesterday across all of the developed market. But definitely the dollar is still front and center, the highest, the strongest going back, Kaylee, to 2002 in a broad weighted index. It's absolutely remarkable. The levels we are seeing on the euro well below parity, the cable rate down at a 114, yeah. the yen testing 145. I mean, these are remarkable moves. And Lisa, the message we seem to have been getting today consistently is for now, there's nothing that's going to stand in the way of this going further. For now, coming up on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio, Chevron CEO Mike Worth to really push this conversation forward in terms of the supply demand dynamic, what they're planning for and the policy potential for windfall taxes and what they'll do with that. This is Bloomberg.